evening. Welcome to the March 21st meeting of the Portsmouth City Planning Board. Call the meeting to order. We have a full board in attendance. And the first order of business is approval of minutes of February 15th, 21st, and February 29th. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Are they all of the minutes? Are you taking them all together? That was all together, but yeah. comment can be on any one. I, I, I'd like to amend the February 21st meeting note, notes so that they... Um, you step up to your microphone. Pull your microphone. So that they capture my comments during the meeting about um, how many of us were taking notes and we all had a clear but maybe different summary of what was going on during that meeting and so I wanted the whole planning board to be able to see the summary recommendation that was the actual document that was being sent to the City Council because the way it stood it was like you sending the document to Beth Moreau who would then present it at a City Council meeting and it leaves out the people who were in the meeting having the discussions and taking their own notes. So I'd like that to be reflected in those notes, in those meeting notes. Just which document? February 21st with the HDC. The HDC document, okay. Or, I, mean, I can accept that amendment to the motion. Is that what you're I, I think so. Do? I think, was that an amend, proposed amendment to accept? Okay. okay. Sorry. <coughs> and Greg, are you good with that? You just made the motion, right? I'm good. Yes, I'm sorry. Yes. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Will be opposed? We have a determination of completeness. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'd also like to make a motion that we move the last item on the agenda regarding discussion of the master plan to first on the agenda. Um, it's our vital duty and responsibility, according to RSA uh, 674, that we, that, the, that all the planning boards in New Hampshire actually um, make sure that their master plan is up to date. And we are in process of a master plan RFP um, that I think needs to be shared with the whole board um, and also needs to be discussed amongst the whole okay, board. Well, you, that's a motion. The to, motion to is move to move it up to, to it up. the is first. Is there a second? Second. I Discussion. I think we have to suspend the rules to make that motion, but I'm not huh? sure. I think yes, it takes a six. It takes a six-three vote. <laughs> Um, I was just speaking I don't, to I, I don't support it because I plan on t discussing this at the end of the meeting and having a workshop to talk about this in particular. So, but any other discussion? Yes, I, I have a continuing discussion, which is if we wait until the 11th, 11 p.m. or 10.30 p.m. or whatever, after the entire board is exhausted from looking at site applications, we will not have the rigorous kind of discussion that is really required here. Um, and it's required here and now. Uh, having a special session is a separate topic entirely. Um, our master plan is woefully outdated. Uh, the data that it's based on is at least 10 years old. Um, and as, as a, um, as a planning board, we can, it, it's really our duty to create uh, master plans, even portions of master plans to review and revise what's already out of date and make it up to date. We haven't been doing that. And so without that kind of data, I think we're flying blind. We, to make strategic decisions, we're not really doing that to make decisions that are based on a, on a plan that's current, we're not really doing that. We're looking at all of these site, site reviews and other applications piecemeal. So um, on the basis of that, I would also like to make a second motion. We, well, have, to, we have to wait until you, we deal with your first motion. Okay. So if there's other discussion about that. Um, Both are suspend the rules, right? I'm just confused also a little bit. 
didn't the planning board pro uh, the master plan process start like a, a year ago more than a year ago didn't it start in january or february of 23 and um i'm not part of the subcommittee but has anything really can someone summarize what's happened since then i think before let's let's decide whether this is a topic we're going to discuss at length now all the reasons i just heard were reasons why i wanted to have a workshop discussion about it so we have a motion we have a second to move this item up for more discussion right now i think we need but um i'm going to ask for a roll call vote because it has to be a 6-3 vote to, for this to proceed but actually i do have a comment uh, since i serve on the master plan subcommittee Jane, wait until we have the vote and then you can have your comments if it passes <clears throat> okay all right mr Simonis. can you reiterate what we're voting the motion and the rules to bring it forward okay. discussing the master plan as first on the agenda instead of at the very end um yes Ms. Begala? yes mr giuliano no Councilor morrell no uh mr bowen I mean, this is a no he's, no. he's an alternate he's an alternate mr hewitt yes mr almeida no vice chair mahoney yes city manager no mr chairman no uh, motion fails five to four we have a determination of completeness for the request of martindale llc as honor for property 99 bow street requesting site plan approval to allow the expansion of the existing deck to include expanded seating for the business as well as public access to the Piscataqua River. This property is shown on Assessor's Map 106, Lot 54, and lies in the Character District 5, or CD5, Downtown Overlay and Historic Districts. The property is in Assessor's Map Lot 106, Map 106, Lot 54, and in Character District CD5, and Downtown Overlay again. This is a I move to determine that the site plan is complete. Second. Discussion? I have to recuse myself from this application. You recuse yourself on this one? Yes. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> application is accepted. Andrew, we're done. Come back. You're all done, Andrew. <laughs> it's later. <laughs> Uh, we have a series of public hearings and just for those in the audience who may or may not be aware we amended our rules recently it's slightly different it's pretty much the same as before they're all available online but basically you'll have three opportunities to speak anyone who wishes to speak three minutes for your first time speaking if you wish to speak at the second or third round you must speak during the first round second round you have five up to five minutes and you can make a presentation the first round is just talk no presentations third round if it's needed is another five minutes and that's just oral presentation so we have a request of uh, public service company of New Hampshire is owner for property located at 300 Gosling Road requesting a wetland conditional use permit according to section 10.1017.60 for the removal of 0.6 miles of existing T13 transmission line and installation of a new 0.6 mile 34 and a half kilovolt distribution line to connect the new Portsmouth terminal Additionally, the project requires replacement of existing structures along the 3171 transmission line from 212 Ocean Road to 100 Borthwick Avenue and the second area off 300 Gosling Road from Schiller Substation to Resistance Substation. The proposed project requires approximately 256,869 square feet of temporary wetland impact and 79,310 square feet of temporary buffer impact in the uplands for access and work pad placement. This property is an assessor's map 214 lot 3 and is in the waterfront industrial and office research districts I'm accusing myself I'm gonna butter thank thank you uh, the question of the alternate I explained to mr. Bowen I'm still waiting for a final decision from legal um, he has sat as an alternate for our ex officio member councillor Moreau we just so he will not be sitting this evening until I hear final word on that but he participates as an alternate Chair, if you were done, thank you. <laughs> <clears throat> give your name and address for the record please yep uh, good evening mr. chairman I am Connor Madison of GZA uh, geo environmental where you consult in for Eversource energy I'm also here with Kurt Nelson, who's sitting in the audience of Ever Source Energy, and he is the applicant that signed this 
application. <clears throat> so thank you for the introduction. We are here for a conditional use permit application. Um, I think of this project as two separate areas. This is the resistance substation retirement project. We're looking on the screen of the south area. Uh, this is map tile, or this is pages one through six on the plan set in the application. The area for the south area is starts at Ocean Road and goes along the northbound side of Route 95, goes over a train track and then along the exit three off ramp area. And then the north area um, is pages seven through nine. Yep, in the application, thank you. Um, this is a, the Schiller substation, uh, Granite Shore Power area. And this is the area where the resistance substation actually resides. So for the south area, uh, Eversource is proposing a wood to steel structure replacement project. Um, currently on pages one through six, there are two distribution line circuits, uh, the 3111 and the 3171. Yep, that's perfect. Um, so if you're driving along northbound on 95 and look just to your right, there are two separate distribution lines that run along 95 and then along the exit three off ramp. That wood has been inspected and is deteriorating through cracks, uh, water damage, and woodpeckers. So Eversource is proposing to go in there and replace those wood structures to steel. Uh, it'll be every single one between Ocean Road and um, the next adjacent road that the road's name is escaping me here, but, oh, it's just uh, Griffin Road, Route 33 over there, that area. Since we are, Eversource is proposing to replace both uh, existing separate distribution lines, Eversource is proposing just to put them all onto one pole structure and put it down the middle of the right away. So we'll be taking two separate lines, putting them on one steel pole structure and putting that steel pole uh, circuit down the middle of the right of way. So that'll just be two lines onto one. As far as the other scope, the northbound scope or north area scope, there is an existing transmission line, the T13 or T13 transmission line that goes from Schiller substation over to the res uh, resistance substation. The proposal is to remove that transmission line entirely and in its place from Portsmouth substation to resistance uh, install a new distribution line. So right now the transmission line is a two pole structure and about 70 feet high. The proposal is to replace that transmission line with a new distribution line, one pole structure, about 40 feet in height. If you're still on board with me throughout the scope, we are also, Eversource is also proposing to remove resistance substation entirely. Um, so that'll just be a complete removal, complete demolition of a substation on the last page. Yep, all the way to the far right. It'll be in the fenced in area. This um, project has multiple different permits. Uh, one of the larger ones that we have going is we have a standard dredge and fill wetland permit application that was filed to the state in early March. We did come to the uh, Conservation Commission in February on the 14th to discuss the standard dredge and fill as well as the conditional use permit application. Both plans are exactly the same. The Conservation Commission, I believe, has like 10 more days for uh, open comment to the state in, ca in case they do want to comment. That standard dredge and fill permit took kind of months of talking and discussion with all of the different agencies. EPA, Army Corps of General, or Army Corps of uh, Engineers, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, Natural Heritage Bureau, Fish and Game. We all came together to discuss the permitting process for this because there is so much temporary wetland impact in the Great Bog, which is considered a priority resource area. That is because it's a prime and then it's also adjacent to a tier two stream. Because of all of that temporary impact, we are pushing it towards the more strenuous the larger review standard dread and fill permit application. I say all of that because the standard dread and fill permit application will push the schedule. So right now, with the potential of a public hearing, we will receive approval from that standard dredge and fill uh, in October. So that would be when this project would 
hope to start is once we receive that permit. What that permit also includes is Fish and Game and Natural Heritage Bureau recommendations. We have finalized the New Hampshire Fish and Game recommendations and Natural Heritage Bureau. Last year we surveyed for two endangered plant species. We didn't find any. We re-coordinated this year, two new plants popped up. So we'll be surveying this summer for two additional plant species. Uh, in addition for all of the permits, we also have an alteration of terrain permit, and that is for any area where you see uh, not the yellow hatching. So the yellow hatching is the timber matting that we'll be using that I'll go further into. But that orange and the kind of gray is uh, proposed gravel installation. So that proposed gravel installation is 100 by 100 foot work areas around each structure, as well as a 16 foot access road so that equipment can get out there safely. For equipment, we need large equipment to conduct this type of work, large cranes, large bucket trucks. The restoration plan for that will be to um, regrade the 100 by 100 foot work area to a 30 by 60 foot work area. Um, so only a 30 by 60 portion of gravel will stay. And that's just in case of emergencies, in case of a bucket truck needs to access the line that has a safe level surface that it can plant on. <clears throat> As far as construction goes, everything will be done by the 2019 Best Management Practice Manual uh, for utility maintenance projects. What that includes is clean timber matting upon entering the site and upon leaving the site. Um, it's a big one for the Great Bog. I'm not sure if, I'm sure you're familiar, but it's full of invasive species. Um, it's just Phragmites, common reed, pretty much everywhere. So we'll be making sure that mats are swept prior to coming into the site and then also upon exiting the site. It's also a DOT requirement that we don't have any vegetation or soil on these mats when they're on the road. So we want to make sure that those are clean. In addition, we also have silt fence and silt sock upon all enter entrances and exits of the wetlands. Um, that silt sock is a fabric material. We're not allowed to use plastic welding. That's a fishing game requirement. Every source uses it across the uh, state. We just use a filter fabric type material so turtles and snakes don't get caught inside them. Like I said, the project is contingent on that San Andreas fill permit. We submitted an alteration of terrain in March, but that's about a three-month review. The standard Andreas fill is a few more months after that. Um, so we are hoping to start in October. It won't take more than one calendar year for this project to be complete. I think that's about all. I had, if you want to walk through the plans, I can walk those through since you do have them up, or we can just go right to questions. Questions for the applicant? I guess I have one. Yes, Jim. I was just curious, uh, how old are the existing wooden poles? So I tried to look up the deed restrict or deeds because we need the deeds for the standard dredge fill. I don't know if Kurt knows any better, but over 50 years is what 50? I have found. And, and so you think they have a 50-year lifespan, then that's probably a good guess? The wooden poles? Yeah. yeah in general, we say a 40 to 50. And, and how long do you expect the new ones to last? Uh, the new steel ones? I know I was watching video of, uh, of the past planning board whenever source came here. Um, the question, it'll be about 70 to 100 years. Um, that's kind of the industry standard. I know they discussed back in April about us not really knowing how long these do last, but 71 to 100 is the industry of how long they should. Okay, thanks. Yes, Bill. Are there any considerations here about capacity? <clears throat> do, as, we, as we think about the development of Portsmouth going forward and your being an important component of, of our uh, economy, yep. vitality, whatever, uh, it, does this have a capacity limit? Does it? Is there any in implication for how much we can do and not do? This doesn't change, in, in my mind, this doesn't change anything about capacity um, since we're not changing out any of the lines. We are removing that transmission line, but right now that's just a substation to substation type line. Um, I don't know if Kurt, yeah, he's <clears throat> prepping back there. <clears throat> Hi there, uh, Kurt Nelson, Manager of Licensing and Permitting for Eversource. So, <clears throat> you 
Yeah, this project, one of the reasons these poles are, are old and decrepit, and um, the reason we're replacing this certain section of distribution line, it's part of a suite of upgrades that will help I'm not sure if it's load potential, but it will help the overall picture in the Portsmouth area. There's an old part of the project is a retirement of an old distribution substation called Resistance Substation, which is on the very outskirts of the Schiller complex. And our engineers identified this particular stretch of distribution line need to be upgraded. So they'll have a conductor. It's, it's the voltage is the same, but it, my understanding it's a, a more robust conductor, so it'll be uh, better apt to serve the local needs. Good. Good. Can you handle a 25% increase in requirement, a 50% increase in requirement? Do you? I, I, I'm not qualified to answer that. I'm, I apologize. Um, but the, um, the engineers, you know, are constantly looking, for forecasting, um, you know, needs and things like that. So this was the, the sum total of these little things that are happening throughout this project are, are intended to help the overall um, uh, serving the load and the need in, in the Portsmouth area. So, so let me ask it this way. L later tonight we're going to be talking about uh, EVs and charging stations, which mm -hmm. is going to be good business for you guys. Uh, over time we may need, we will definitely need more electricity. Mm -hmm. I assume that you guys do good strategic planning. Uh, do you share that planning with the city? Oh, good question. I, I think a lot of that is, I, I know a lot of load forecasting, load need assessment is done through the ISO New England uh, entity, which is the regional transmission operator. As far as how, um, how the local district, this is a distribution project, so more local, how that planning is, uh, is carried out, I'm, I'm more on the permitting side of things, so I can't speak to that, but Eversource is certainly, would certainly get folks in touch with you if you have questions about uh, what the forecast looks like in the city and and what sort of long-range plans there are and that sort of thing So the question is kind of if we were doing a strategic plan and we wanted to know if you we had enough electric capacity to do What we might want to do over the next 15 20 years mm -hmm. uh, Would you be able to do that? Yeah, so I, that, I, I would, would you certainly kind of certainly take that as a question that it would be helpful to provide that to our planning department if they don't have that information Yes, I can get. Uh, I can certainly get uh, some of our our folks who handle that those affairs in touch with the city. Sure, absolutely. Related to that, just a quick question: If you wanted to increase the capacity, would you be putting in different poles? Not this. This was probably the most robust um, design we have. For this is a this is a thirty four five kV distribution circuit. So these, this is these are the most robust poles that we have for that okay. for that Thank voltage type. Thank yep. you. Andrew. Does the state of New Hampshire or and or Eversource take wildlife and vegetation uh, patterns into consideration when doing this type of work? Yeah, absolutely. We we are put through um, a rigorous review by the New Hampshire Fish and Game Department. Um, we have under their under their rules pursuant to um, our wetlands permitting and alteration of terrain permitting. We uh, submit a detailed correspondence memo to them explaining the nature of the project and invariably we uh, are typically um, uh, given, uh, we have dialogue and there are very oftentimes time of year restrictions relative to various wildlife and or plant species and that sort of thing. So um, a lot of my job and Connor's job is to try and deal with that logistical puzzle that you're given between construction timing needs and outage needs and whatnot, but we're very, our work these days is very much driven by the conditions that the New Hampshire Fishing Game is, is places upon us. And given those constraints, do you have a total estimate for duration of this project? Y yeah, the, this, this is, um, I think Connor said about a year. The, um, because this is kind of different bits and pieces, we've got a substation demolition, we've got some work inside a substation, we've got a transmission line, removal and then we've got a distribution line replacement <clears throat> through that entire process might we'd say I, I couldn't imagine it would go beyond a year um, but but that's a that's a safe estimate um, most likely this I would say the biggest footprint we have is that section of distribution line along the highway uh, it's about a mile or so that should not that should f should proceed um, 
in, in a condensed manner. That shouldn't just languish and, 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 and take many months of, of um, inactivity in between things that are going on there. Any other questions? Public hearing on this, right? Okay. Okay, I'm going to open the public hearing if everybody remembers the rules. Public hearing is open now. First round speakers, if any, wish to speak to, for, or against this application. Please approach and give your name and address. You have three Thank you, minutes. Mr. Chairman, uh, Rich DePentima, 16 Dunland Way, Portsmouth. I have more than a comment. I have a question. Um, for the north section of this proposal going from Sh to Schiller Station, does that involve the line going uh, behind Dunland Way um, where there are there's an existing line now going from Dunland Way by the railroad tracks? We can't answer that question, but the applicant may when when he has he has the ability to speak during this time period as well. Okay. I, I I ask only because I'm I'm, a, I'm attending a swag meeting. I'm a, I'm a member of the uh, mm -hmm. Safe Water Drinking Advisory Board, and I'm, I'm leaving that meeting to ask that question. So I appreciate if I can get an answer so I can return back to my work with them. <clears throat> sure, I can answer that right now if that's okay. Um, the portion of this project will end right on this last page. So you can see, I believe that's done when in the bottom right corner. Um, so it will not, not affect anything further towards what is that, east of that section right there. So thank you. Anybody else here or on Zoom who speak to for or against this application? I'm going to assume there are no second round speakers except for first round speakers, so I'm going to close the public hearing. Board discussion. I'd make a motion that we vote to find the conditional use permit application meets the requirements set forth in section 10.101760 of the ordinance and adopt the findings of facts as presented. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? None. <clears throat> I'll continue to make a motion we vote to grant the condition use permit with the following um, conditions in our memo 2.1 through 2.3. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? None. You are approved. Thank you so Thank much. You. Have a nice night. Thank you. Thank you. We've next is a request of Suzanne Winslow, revocable trust as owner for property located at 999 Islington Street, requesting a conditional use permit in accordance with section 10.440, use 19.50 for an outdoor dining and drinking area as an accessory use. This property is on assessor's map 171, lot 15, and lies in character district 4, or CD4, LU 24-14. Who is here to speak to this application? Hello, thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Um, oh, sorry. Not you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is John Edwards. I'm the owner of Behind the Plate, the LLC, the restaurant that has opened and been in operation since October 18th. Um, so we're a new establishment, and I was just wanted to speak on behalf. So I'm the one applying for the permit. Um, we are the restaurant, obviously, like I just said there, right there. Um, this project is much smaller than the project before us. Uh, it's just a uh, small patio. There's an inlaid brick patio already in place there. There's no construction needed for this project whatsoever. Um, Image Arts, who Suzanne Winslow, the owner of the building, um, is our neighbor and allowed me to speak on behalf. The brick inlay that I'm speaking about is right there on the right-hand side of the screen. Um, the previous business was using this, uh, hence why there are picnic tables there. Those will not be the tables that we're planning on using. Um, they, I don't know if they ever had any approval. I wasn't a part of that business at all. Um, but we are looking to have three uh, six-top tables uh, adjacent or right along the side of the building, and then two lounge-style uh, four-seat uh, spaces um, at the end of it. We do feel that this will add a lot of beautification to the area. Uh, we're looking to add planter boxes, which will 
uh, in case like the housing for the rope and everything to close in the area. Um, again, no construction whatsoever is needed. Um, the brick patio that's there is brand new. Um, when Islington project was being completed, the town actually was uh, kind enough to inlay that brick patio there um, when they were done with the Islington Street project. Um, so, and our door is uh, butted right to that patio. Um, so we have an opportunity to be able to close off to the left hand side of the screen there, which shows where it butts up to the sidewalk while still leaving the handicap ramp completely accessible on the right hand side. Um, and keep everything absolutely ADA. So I believe that's all I have. Any questions the applicant? Yeah. Um, in one of these pictures, it shows at the front of the building where the picnic tables are a lot of meters for, I, I don't know, whatever utility that those meters are for. I guess I'm just wondering is, do you have some sort of plan about how to protect from anyone being able to do anything bad to them, shall well, we say? <laughs> so there are two steel poles right there directly in front of them, which I know that doesn't deter people. That's more to deter car, right. or cars. Um, <laughs> our patio will end at the line of that brick. So okay. we will have a planter box right there where that table is um, okay. with fresh herbs and plants. And then running where that Hoovies box is, we're going to be moving that closer to where those two lines are, the cables attached. And so there won't be any opportunity for anyone to enter that grassy area. Excellent. Can I ask one more question? Mm -hmm. Exactly how are people based off of this plan? Is the, I see like vestibule, is that the actual entrance so they can go walk along the building? Is that how they get between the restaurant and that without going? Correct. Okay. Directly in front of the door there, that uh, thick black line is a black rail, okay. um, which stops all traffic from entering entirely. Um, our patio and our barrier will start from the left hand side of that rail and then move to that first planter box, which are the yellow circles and then work its way around the side of the, the perimeter. Great, thank you. Um, can we go back to that utility meter? It looks like a gas meter right by the picnic table. And just further out in that shot, it looks like, is that the driveway entrance for the, that building or the next building? Um, further down the road? Just, yeah, just right there. Looks yes, like. yep, so that is about uh, I would call it 20 feet. That's not my property. That's not that is the property, but that's not part of the space that I'm looking to use whatsoever. So 20 feet down that grassy area, there is the wraparound for the driveway. So what I'm wondering is if they screen that utility meter, does that create some sight line different um, challenge for that driveway uh -uh. and Islington Street? Like, can you have something right up to the sidewalk, a fence or a screen or something? Is that is that acceptable? Is that, is that me? Sorry. There is, a, there is a dimensional requirement um, to in zoning case. that you can't have, you can't create a blind spot on the corner. Right. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. there, there's a certain distance away in which you, but if I look closely, it looks like they're just hanging a rope across on a couple of bollards. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Yeah, this is, yeah, so four by fours that stand about three feet tall with just the rope barrier just for, to create that. So your planter, your planter will be three feet tall? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, a lot. that's Okay, mm -hmm. that, that's, that's okay. You're going to look over it if you're driving. I'm okay with that. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, a couple of quick questions. So everything that you're proposing is within your property, yes. the building's property, correct? Yes. Um, any additional lighting required for this application? Um, Just the use of like a bistro string lighting, um, nothing. In, yeah, that's no, good. no spotlights, no light, no, no. additional light pollution. Okay. Um, are you are you considering or wanting to um, have music over speakers outside? Yeah. Okay, excellent. That's it. My questions. Will there be liquor service? Yes. Yes. Yes, sir. Okay. Any other questions? I guess we'll open the public hearing. If anybody here or on Zoom wish to speak to, for, or against this application? Anybody on Zoom? No hands have been raised. Raise your hand if you're on Zoom if you wish to speak. Last call if anybody wishes to speak to, for, or against this application. I'm going to close the public hearing. <coughs> I'll make a motion. 
vote that the conditional use permit application meets the criteria set forth in section 10 243.20 and adopt the findings of fact as presented second any discussion All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Nobody opposed. <coughs> Keep going. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Go ahead. We have to vote to. Yeah, uh, need vote. another motion. We need yes. another vote. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. Vote <laughs> to approve the condition. I had the conditions, now we have to. I make a motion to uh, vote to approve the conditional use permit as presented. In second. Any discussion on that? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? <clears throat> now you're really approved. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> so much. Good luck. That's why it's put this separately. So look at the request of Rosemary L. Gardner, revocable trust is owner for property located at 50 Odeon Point Road, requesting an after the fact wetland conditional use permit yeah. in accordance with section 10.1017 to come into compliance for a wetland, wetland violation for construction without permits of 376 square feet of stone wall within a prime and tidal wetland buffer and within an inland wetland and wetland buffer and construction of 776 square feet of stone swale to redirect stormwater into the salt marsh and installation of 444 square feet of crushed stone in the buffer. This property is in assessor's map 224 lot 10-3 and lies within a single residence or SRA district. Who is here to present this application? Hello. I am Elizabeth Oliver. I'm an environmental consultant from Norman Doe Associates. I'm presenting on behalf of the property owner, Mr. Jack Gardner, who's also here in the audience this evening. Um, as you've summarized, we are looking for a after the fact conditional use permit to conduct activities on this private property to restore impacts that were brought about by the property owner to manage stormwater runoff onto his property that was resulting in significant erosion down the slope of the property. Um, the impacts included um, the installation of swale progressively over time, as well as he rebuilt a section of the stone wall that's at the base of the property. Um, the so what are you looking for in here? <laughs> Go ahead, I'm just getting to a different map. Yep. Unless you want. Nope. Uh, one, so yeah. the proposed work is to remove the stone from the swale uh, and to replace it with live stakes of shrubby vegetation to improve water quality management and reduce flow velocities down the swale. Uh, we are also proposing to uh, lower the elevation of the stone wall and return it to a configuration that's more conforming with the pre-existing stone wall. Uh, we are also planning on installing a number of uh, woody shrubs in various places such as restoration areas one which is upslope of that stone wall and restoration area uh, two which is the lower section of the swale. Um, the swale does contain as well as stone and includes some liner, which is part of the reason why the stone needs to come out. We can't just plant through the stone, the woody vegetation. Um, and there is also a landscaping liner that forms an edging. That landscaping liner will be replaced by a small amount of stone that's retained at the upslope end of the swale and it'll just form a line to try and keep the stormwater flow that's coming from off the property onto the property going into the vegetated swale that becomes established. <clears throat> so the plan is to conduct this work this coming spring and there is a robust during construction and post construction monitoring plan that Normando will be overseeing. It's a five year process at minimum or at maximum is the plan, hope plan. Um, and I believe that is the general sense of the project. Do you guys have any specific questions? Questions of the applicant? Yes, Jim. I'm um, just curious. Um, oh, go ahead. You're next, Jane. Is this part of a, a 
a DES enforcement action, or is this voluntarily, or how is this all coming about? So this was brought about by a notification from the city of Portsmouth. It was brought to Normando's attention when it was recommended that he maybe, the private property owner, maybe seek the assistance of an environmental consultant to figure out a solution for the issue. Um, and we answered his phone call. Uh, we brought NHDES in because it was apparent, looking at the property, that these were also state wetland violations. We have been coordinating with NHDES, and uh, Mr. David Price of the Compliance Branch of the Wetlands Bureau is aware of the plan. He's reviewed it. He's approved it as is. Um, he's been kept abreast of any changes to the plan as a result of recommendations from the ComCon that we had last month. Um, and the recommendations that were provided by the ComCon, we have actually responded to in the updated plan. Okay, so it's fair to say it's a Portsmouth enforcement action with cooperation with DES? Yes. Okay, thanks. Yep. Jane? Um, yeah, um, am I correct in reading from your materials that the total uh, square footage of the impacted area is 4,572 square feet? Yes in terms of jurisdictional areas on the property. And that basically means the inland wetland area that has been disturbed. So there are two wetlands that are on the property. There is a tidal wetland that is down below the stone wall. That is not impacted in any way. Um, all impacts stayed out of that footprint. Um, all wetland impacts are restricted to wetland POG W2, which is a forested wetland that basically extends up from the road where there are two culverts. One of the culverts is connected to the stormwater drainage system for part of the development. The other is connected to a depressed area on the other side of the road. Um, both of these culverts drain into this wetland on an abutting property. Then they come onto the Gardner property and go down slope where they are now captured by this armored swale that is present. So in table two, mm -hmm. wetland or wetland buffer activity, mm -hmm. um, you have a number of lines there that say wetland buffer area to be disturbed. So that is area that will be disturbed because we will be impacting it to take out all of that stone um, and to aerate the soil in restoration area one. That restoration area one is a pretty sizable area. Um, and that was somewhat compacted as a result of putting this, the rebuilt stone wall in. And so we have to redisturb it again to restore it. So when I add up those lines, it comes out to that 4,500 mm -hmm. square foot figure. but. That's the work to be done at, with the projected impact. What, what is the impact that 12 years of progressive building of these, these stormwater drains and swales and uh, what is the impacted area as it stands today before your restoration impact? So the impacted, well, that, that is my point, is that the, we are keeping all impacts restricted to the areas that were impacted previously. So the impacted areas by the armored swale is, if I'm looking it up real quick. Is it all captured in table it's, two? It's, it's, it's not all captured in table two because table two does not allow us to, like we filled this out as part, this is basically a recreation of the conditional use permit application tables. And so we did not break out what is swale, what is crushed stone that was spread around the base of the swale in places, what is rebuilt stone wall in terms of wetland area or in terms of buffer area because that function wasn't allowed in the permit application fillable tables. I, I guess my, my question is, what is the amount of area that was progressively impacted in the 12 years prior to you entering for restoration. I, I'm surprised I can't find that from the application. I don't know if it's something I'm overlooking, but it seems like we should 
know that because in the application it talks about compensatory mitigation mm -hmm. and i understand about the part of the mitigation that's being interpreted as your many plantings mm -hmm. but depending on what your answer is to the square foot of the area that has been impacted over these 12 years i'm wondering if there shouldn't be additional compensatory mitigation or if you've had any conversations with the city about things like fines. But it depends on the relative size of that area that was impacted over the 12 years. So what was that size? So the square footage of area that is listed in that table, that is the size. That is my point. Yeah, I don't understand it because it all says to be, to be disturbed. It's part of your restoration plan. It doesn't capture the state <clears throat> of where this property is for the 12 years of building the stone walls and diverting the water and having the swales. That's, uh, that's what I'm wondering, but thank you. I'm trying the to scope, think. The scope of. I'm trying to think how else to rephrase this um, and Basically, what it is is that those impacts to buffer and or wetland are, you see those colored areas, those are our restoration areas. Those are also the same amount of area that we have impacted or that have been impacted on the project. The square footage is one and the same. Okay. Okay. And so when you are engaging in compensatory mitigation, have there been any discussions with either the state or the city about anything like fines, given that this went on for 12 years without There has not permitted? been, so when we spoke with NHDES, they did not cite that they expected payment of fines. And when I was consulting with Mr. Peter Britz and Ms. Kate Amay from the city, there was no discussion of payment of fines specifically brought up outside of the payments associated with applying for a conditional use permit application. That was not brought up. It was brought up as a potential by NHDES, but that was more cited as a, if the property owner is not willing to consider restoration, there are going to be some pretty serious repercussions. Numbers were not provided and it didn't go past that mentioning because I assured them that I would communicate to my client that a alternative solution was best. Thank you. I'm just concerned about a deterrent mm -hmm. to people doing this and then coming in for exactly this and after the fact, CUP. But thank you. Mm -hmm. I don't so much have a question. I just want to address. Uh, we've actually fixed in our zoning that we actually have to have them put labels where there are wetlands mm -hmm. to let people know so that was because this is not the first time this has happened and so therefore we do now try to help homeowners understand where the wetland buffers are mm -hmm. so that they don't disrupt them yes and and that is part of the plan I believe it's written very clearly in there somewhere I know it's a lot of text to get through uh, but there will be signage placed and it will be either along the wetland boundary or along the boundary for the restoration area so even if it's a upland buffer of a wetland, it will be protected because it's part of that restoration area. The IED is once we've, we've done things to improve it, we don't want a future property owner accidentally going in and mowing it all down. <laughs> Picking up on what two of the members have said, there is a per diem fine that can be instituted. It's state statute. It's I'm not going to cite the numbers. They're enough to get anybody's attention for the first day and then every day thereafter. And that's tracked in the zoning ordinance. This is a zoning violation. 
So I congratulate the owner for being here and hiring Normando. You guys have a good reputation for doing good work. My question is, how would this application be different if they hadn't done anything? What if it were just, because I understand there's a drainage issue on one side of the property that would probably want to be dealt with. What might you have done differently? I honestly might have sought further upfront discussion with the city to try and find a further upstream solution and engage the abutting parcel. Because really what this is, is this is a stormwater issue brought about by the development that is discharging onto private property that then discharges onto Mr. Gardner's property that then eroded his property. And while not the correct move, <clears throat> we should have come to the city and really pushed for a solution, he made actions on his own. However, some of those actions, he did invite members of the city to his property to review it and showed them the issues. And what he was advised was to slow the velocity of water flow across his property. He didn't, I don't know as he was told point blank, this is a serious issue, you should seek an environmental consultant to design a solution. That recommendation didn't come until 2022 when he rebuilt a stone wall. Again, not on the up and up in terms of the zoning ordinance, but it seems like the recommendation to have somebody come in and help with this from an environmental consultancy standpoint was pretty delayed. Do so we would not have necessarily put the swale where it is. It might have been a, it might not have been a, a swale exactly. Our idea is to try and minimize the amount of disturbance that we're going to put by having are going to do by taking the stone out. So you may have just partially answered my last question. Do you, did you feel constrained in your proposed restoration of this site or were you just told to do the best you could? I felt constrained in the fact that we wanted to keep any kind of solution on just Mr. Gardner's property a bigger solution Honestly, it would have had to deal with figuring out some other alternative solution for that stormwater drain. So up, upstream issues aside, on this property, do you feel it's the best you could do? Yes, while limiting the amount of earth disturbance that we're doing while doing the restoration work. I'm very cognizant of the fact that this is a prime wetland in a very sensitive environment. This slope receives a lot of rain every single time that we get a storm event. The last thing I wanted to do was disturb another square foot of space that we didn't have to. So it made sense to just keep the swale where it is and do the best that we can with that footprint. Thank you. Yeah, I had a question in your in your verbiage. It, you did state that there was a visit from the city in 17, mm -hmm. but do you know what department or was that, I mean, obviously it wasn't <laughs> that is probably better answered by the property owner. I am aware that Mr. Peter Britz was in attendance, and I believe somebody from the public works, but do you have an? Okay, okay. And I don't have a name for the person from public works. To follow your statement, I mean, I've been in town long enough when Tucker's Cove was built, so it seems to be the drainage plan down at that corner near Sagamore, and the outfall pipes headed towards the water or the original problem yes okay yeah I would say it's it's the stormwater culverts if you look back through the photos and if we were on site today you would see that the the culvert that is connected with the stormwater drains that's the bigger channel right no no I'm very familiar with the area thank you thank you you know the question yes Jim uh, just like one last one I guess um, does this drainage all come from the private development or is any of this drainage from from city roads? Uh, the four storm drains that I was able to determine are connected to that culvert are just that development road. That's private or public road? I would assume it's public, but public. I did not look okay, into that. So, uh, 
I was just thinking about easements. You know, typically when you have drainage leaving, say, a town or state highway, you have an easement for your drainage legally to, to be on someone else's property. And I didn't know if that was formalized here. And then in that easement, maintenance responsibilities are outlined too, so that if sometimes the public entity is responsible for the drainage issues, say, on your client's property, and sometimes it's worked out not. So I just didn't know if that had been formalized legally. So there is no easement on this property or the abutting property that I am aware of with regards to these culverts. A file was claimed for insurance, and that claim was denied with the statement that he had no claim to any damages, as I understood it. Okay. But it, it is something that would make sense to me. It's not like it's his private driveway. He's not created this issue. It's a product of the development. And right. I mean, maybe even at the time that they put the development in, it was a fine drainage design. But now we have more storms, bigger storms. Maybe the development is bigger. There's more impervious surface. And the setup just hasn't been updated. But just to clarify, all of the impacts that took place were not just related to, to handling that stormwater. Is that correct? No. So the impacts related to the swale and the crushed stone, which are the yellow, the green, and the blue areas, those are related to trying to manage stormwater runoff, capturing that stormwater runoff and trying to convey it down to the body of water. The pink and the blue areas, like the light blue areas, those are related to the impact associated with rebuilding that stone wall at the bottom. So most of the impacts are not associated with the drainage? A fair amount are. Well, I would need just looking to. at your graph. Yeah. <clears throat> Any other However, questions? there was a claim by the property owner that he felt that the stone wall was helping to manage runoff from, get, from going into the marsh too quickly that it was causing the water to back up behind that stone wall, which was part of the reason why he rebuilt it. Okay, any other questions for the applicant? Thank you. I guess we'll open the public hearing. Anybody here or on Zoom that wishes to speak to, for, or against this application? Yes, sir. I think you're Mr. Gardner, but if you could I say am, your name and address. Uh, I am Jack Gardner, and I and my wife own 50 Odeon Point Road in Portsmouth. I just wanted to fill in on, on a couple of things here. Um, first of all, uh, I want to put aside the, the uh, that there was an attitude of who cares about the town here? I'm just going to do what I want to do. That could have been far, farther from the truth. Uh, uh, we moved here in uh, 2016. And I saw there was water problems right away. Uh, and the water was coming out of the larger area and coming into the backyard. And I called the town, and the answer, Public Works, and the answer that I got was, well, that's going to happen sometimes. You better live with it. <laughs> okay? And the only thing that I did was put some stone in, which was the beginning of the swale, okay, to keep the water in. But then the water kept on having problems, so I said, to myself, I don't want to start a fight with the town. I'm going to start putting the stone in and solve the problem. I did not know that it was in the wetlands. Okay, I did not know at all. Um, then, when the uh, even my best efforts with the uh, with the swale um, uh, didn't work, and there was a erosion coming through. Now, that was the two seven, 2017 uh, meeting that I invited the town out, Public Works. And they brought uh, Peter with them. And they brought someone who analyzed the property and said the property is the velocity of the water going through. And I said, OK, that's great. Uh, and I was appreciative. What do I do about that? And he says, well, put some sticks or dirt around. around. It, it, it was a no answer. OK. So when I called them a couple of days later, Public Works, I asked them what was I was looking for help fixing this problem, the answer I got was uh, put, in, put in a claim with the town's insurance company. 
I said, but I don't want money. I want help in solving this particular problem. Okay. I, okay. I said, uh, if this is the way we're going, I said, maybe if I get a claim paid by their insurance company, it'll get somebody's attention in town. Um, I got a phone call from the uh, uh, insurance company of, a while later and said, your town, your um, claim has been refused. And I said, why is it refused? And they said, because the public rights department says it's not their fault. Right? So here I am, okay, not knowing where I'm going here. I, I contacted a lawyer and said, what am, I, what am I going to do here? And I, the advice I got was, don't get into a five or ten year fight with the town about this. Pay for it yourself and get and move on. I can tell you between consulting uh, fees and I have the estimate as of today to do this work that's there, I am, my cost is $100,000 to do what is on that piece of paper. $100,000. So talk about a fine. I've been fined. Okay? I've been fined. So that's really the, the, the motive and the background of this thing. This was not somebody who was just doing as he damn well pleased. That, that's not me, but I am a problem solver. Okay? And that's what I tried to do. And the thing that finally got the whole thing uh, uh, in around is nobody said anything about the swale from 2017 until 2022. What happened was uh, I had the stone wall built rebuilt in 2022 because there was erosion problems coming in in that particular area, okay? Um, I thought I was rebuilding an old stone wall that I didn't need a permit to do it. That was a bad assumption on my part, okay? So when uh, I became aware that I was building a stone wall, uh, Peter came out, did his job, okay, and told me I was, I was in trouble. That was not his words, but this was, this was a problem on the stone wall. And I said, fine. He said, you need a permit. So what I said, fine. Okay, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring in the swale and the other areas. They're not going to get off that easy, but this is, that this is a stone wall problem. Okay, we're going to fix this thing one way or the other. Well, the fix is $100,000 out of Jack Gardner's pocket. Okay, so. Thank you for that explanation, Mr. Gardner. Say, fine. I appreciate it. Thank you. Does anybody else wish to speak to for or against this application, here or on Zoom? I'm not going to ask for any second round speakers. I'm going to close the public hearing. I'll make a motion. <clears throat> Uh, make a motion to uh, vote to grant the conditional use. Uh, vote to find that the conditional use permit application meets the requirements set forth in section 10.1017.50 of the ordinance and adopt the findings of fact as amended. Do I need to read the amendments? No, it should be as presented. We didn't change anything. Okay. Second. As presented. As presented. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Conditions have been met. Would you like to continue, Paul? Uh, sure. Uh, I'd like to make a that same motion to. Uh, Number two. Yeah, I'm lost on my thing here. Vote to grant the. Conditional use as permit as presented. Second. With the conditions listed in the staff memo. 2.1, 2.2, and 3. 2.1 through 2.3. I'll still second that. Okay. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Thank you very much. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is the request of Jewel Court Properties LLC as owner for property located at 33 Jewel Court, Unit S1, requesting a conditional use permit in accordance with mm -hmm. Section 10.1112.14 to allow 205 parking spaces where 242 are required. 
said property is on assessor's map 155 lot 5-S1 and is in character district 4-W or CD4-W and historic district. Who is here to present this application? Uh, good evening, Mr. Chair and members of the board. Uh, Chris Mulligan from Bozen and Associates in Portsmouth on behalf of the applicant, 33 Jewel Court Properties, LLC. With me is Ms. Jessica Kaiser, who is the principal of Jewel Court Properties, um, the owner of the building that um, we're seeking the relief in. Um, as the uh, chair noted, this is a request for a conditional use permit related to parking on the site. The site is a condominium site uh, composed of four separate standalone buildings um, that um, have been in place for hundreds of years. The uh, condominium has 205 spaces total um, apportioned amongst the various condominium units. Each building is its own standalone unit within the condominium. Um, and Ms. Kaiser's unit is the building at 33 Jewel Court. Um, that um, is uh, currently used as office space. Um, Ms. Kaiser uh, is a veteran of the wedding industrial complex. She's also the principal of Hawthorne Creative, which is a marketing uh, firm <coughs> that supports uh, the wedding and event industry. And what she's seeking to do is transform uh, a portion of the office space at 33 Jewel Court from uh, the office space that Hawthorne Creative previously uh, inhabited, uh, convert that to event space. Um, what we've done is provided uh, a table of the required parking and we've established that we need, um, we would otherwise need 242 spaces for the combined uses on this site. Obviously there are only 205. Any change in use on the site is likely going to require a conditional use permit similar to what we're requesting here. Um, so the um, proposal is to uh, lease out the event space um, on a periodic basis during the year, we will contractually obligate the users of the space to um, employ valet or shuttle parking services to mitigate the impact on the existing parking. Um, and beyond that, I think the staff report um, and the proposed findings of fact kind of lay out the argument for this, but I'll just go through the uh, criteria um, in your regulations <laughs> for granting a conditional use permit. Section 141, we've submitted a parking demand analysis and it has been reviewed and recommended by the Technical Advisory Committee. That parking demand analysis was conducted over a weekend in February at what we anticipate to be peak times for uh, these types of events and it showed that there would be between 66 and 96 available spaces um, uh, on the lot um, utilizing the 205 spaces that are um, or, uh, factoring in the 205 spaces that um, are available within this development. So um, there is a sufficient number of off-street parkings for the uh, off-street parking spaces for this proposed use. Um, section 142, um, we again will uh, uh, require contractually the users of the event space to employ valet or uh, shuttle services um, so as to eliminate any excess demand for parking associated with these events. Um, I would also point out, and this is in the materials, that the Condominium Association um, has a, uh, a mechanism to, uh, uh, or has the authority to regulate parking on the site. Um, and so in the unlikely event that what we're proposing produces some type of conflict with other users, that conflict <clears throat> is most likely to be with other members of this condominium association. So 
The point here is the first phone call is likely not going to be to Jason Page that somebody somebody's parking is being impacted. It's likely going to be in-house within the condominium association and it can be dealt with. Again, the materials we uh, have provided indicate that that should not um, be a, uh, a large concern. Um, however, um, uh, I think that is an important um, issue or a, an important element for you to consider. Um, then um, finally, um, Section 143, based on all of the above, we believe that there is adequate um, uh, parking on the premises for this use, uh, especially considering um, the limitations we're going to contractually place on the users of the event space. So that is the application in a nutshell. If you have any questions or um, if any. Yes, questions to the applicant, Joe. Uh, just quickly, um, in my thorough review of this, um, I was in support, uh, remain in support, by the way, um, of the application knowing that um, um, I would imagine uh, when, when you say um, um, shuttle service, what you really mean are trolleys are going to be bringing wedding parties here. We see it in Portsmouth all of the time. Um, wedding parties tend to not want to drive from location to location. Um, so for that reason, I, I, I thought that it was a, um, it was a very reasonable request. Um, I think your bigger challenge is going to be managing where the trolleys are stopping and dropping people off, but that's a lot easier to do than, than chasing, you know, a field, uh, you know, cars all over the site. But for that reason, I, I, I'm glad to see that you are contractually listing that in the application. That makes great sense. Thank you. Yes, Jane. Could you describe the uh, noise situation or the? potential problem that's mentioned in here and the noise, why a noise study was done? So a noise study was done in connection. Thank you for asking uh, about that. that. That's an important component. Um, in order to proceed to where we are now, we had to be before the zoning board for a special exception, um, which was obtained, I believe, in February. Um, one of the criteria for granting a special exception is that the use you're proposing um, does not uh, have negative externalities um, that affect neighboring properties, including vibrations, noise, um, pollution, runoff. Um, so a, a noise study was performed specifically to address that element of the requirement to gain a special exception, which we received from the zoning board. Are your shuttles going to be coming from hotels? I can answer these questions. Hi there, I'm Jessica Kaiser, uh, the owner of 33 Jill Court. Uh, they will be, we're looking at contracting with Grace Limousine who would then be um, going over to the hotels first to pick up the guests that are attending the wedding or event. Um, in the event that it's a wedding, they would then be bringing them to the ceremony site. That might be at Prescott Park or some other place in Portsmouth, and then shuttling from the ceremony site over to um, Jewel Court in the West End. They would then be probably going back to Grace Limousine's parking lots to wait there until pickup time at the end of the event. One other question. It seems like a great use, but I was surprised that February was picked as the peak period. And I think February was probably picked because it was convenient. Is your peak period going to be in the summer? The peak period will be in the summer. Um, I can't, you know, I, I have been uh, an owner of the building in the West End for the last 10 years. Um, I would say that in the West End, regardless of the season, um, there is not a high level of traffic congestion in the summer versus the winter. Um, because so much more traffic goes into town in the summer. So we don't see a big change in the volume of traffic throughout the year. Um, but the reason that we conducted the audit at that time was because it was requested. We received the approval in uh, January, I believe, uh, was when we received the approval for um, to host the, the gathering space, special the special exception. Um, and so they asked us from that point on before we went with, met with you to do the audit. So we had this period of time to conduct the audit to determine how many spaces were available on a weekend between Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. 
And how is the parking shared with the other users? It's so it's first come first serve. We're mixed use, um, and so everybody within the condo association is allowed to use any space at any time. Okay. Um, it did actually start out in uh, 2017, I believe, when Chimberg bought his buildings, and I was the first one after King mm -hmm. Weinstein to own when Chimberg came in. We were concerned about parking, and therefore everybody had permits, and there was somebody on site on certain intervals to kind of monitor everything. Things became so fluid and easy that they withdrew the permit parking. They withdrew the kind of person that was monitoring because everybody seemed to have plenty of space when they needed it. Okay, thank you. Yes, Bill. Will there be any organized activity outside of the building? <clears throat> I'm not quite sure I understand that. Oh, you mean like a cocktail reception on the... S well, um, so a, 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 a bar? No. A little band, dance place? No. Tables no. to sit? No, we have no intention of outside okay. entertainment. <clears throat> Any other questions of the applicant? No, sorry. Is that a finger for a question? No, no sorry. <laughs> Thank you. It's like an auction. You've got to be careful. Exactly. <laughs> I didn't buy it. <laughs> I'm going to open the public hearing. Anybody here or on Zoom wish to speak to for or against this application? Name and address for the record, sir. Kim Bridge, Cass Street in Portsmouth. I'll give this a try only because we already have, myself and my neighbors already have overflow parking from businesses on Albany Street, Brewery Lane, and Islington Street on Cass Street. There's parking daily, on a daily basis from these businesses there. As far as the 205 spaces that are apparently open to, for this event, I don't believe there are that many available. I know people living in the apartments and condos on the corner of Albany and Brewery Lane have leased spaces in that area. CVS owns their park, according to city maps I have looked at, CVS owns their parking areas on both sides of their building. I just don't see a feasible use for this space in this area. If any of you have been in the area of first weekend in December when the Button Factory has its gathering, that's pretty much proof that there is no parking for an event of this size in this area. Don't know what else to say, so thank you. Thank you. Anybody else here or on Zoom who wish to speak to for or against this application? Again, if you're on Zoom, raise your hand. Otherwise, you're going to lose the opportunity. Any second round speakers wish to speak? Nobody else wishes to speak. I'm going to close the public hearing. Mr. Chair, I make a motion that we vote to find the conditional use per permit application meets the requirements set forth in Section 10.1112.14 of the ordinance and adopt the findings of fact as presented. Second. Second. Discussion on the conditions. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? I'm opposed. One opposed. I will continue to make a motion to vote the conditional use permit as presented. Second. Discussion? Yes. You. <laughs> um, I, when I first read about this, I was considering I don't live very far from this and drive through this neighborhood on a regular basis. I thought it was a really bad idea, but I have to agree with uh, Mr. Almeida when they talk about the fact that everyone will be contractually obligated for um, you know, rentals so that they aren't using a whole lot of parking. That made me actually open up my eyes to actually think it's a possibility that it could work in this area. So um, that along with the fact that they do have the easement onto the CVS property, um, I say, let's give it a try. I mean, no one's going to want to have a wedding there if they're going to have issues with parking. So the market's going to actually figure that out all on its own. So that's why I will be uh, in favor of this. Uh, Andrew and then Jane. 
Yeah, more just uh, light observation. I drive through that area quite a bit. Um, and obviously that CVS choke point um, could use some awareness and maybe some adaptation to just facilitate driving and uh, directional properly. Um, so if uh, uh, the applicant, as well as some of those other neighbors mentioned, would be so kind to just consider that, kind of think about the flow of traffic, whether it's for events or just in general during business day. I know that uh, if people are not from this area, they generally get taken off guard when somebody's coming at them from the opposite light. Um, so maybe some relining or directional signs may be really advantageous, but otherwise I really, really like this idea and I think it will bring a lot of life to this side of town and pull some events out of downtown into this new West End corridor that we are really excited about. So it's cool. Sure. I just feel that um, you can request a parking CUP or you could reduce your capacity in this event space, thus reducing how many how much parking you need um, however you know I hear you about having these valets and having this other arrangement people are still going to have to park somewhere ultimately so I don't know if they're all parked at the hotels and then they're coming to this event and then they're going back to their hotel parking space or what but it seems to me like the capacity could have been adjusted Any other? Oh, Mr. Chair. Paul, oh, sorry. So just so I'm clear on what we're voting on, the, the condition of use is that they're going to contractually obligate people to use off-site parking. Or is it good? They're, they're required to have 242 parking spaces, and they don't right. have that on-site. Right. So they only have 205, so the planning board could grant a conditional use permit to provide less than the required parking. Right, but we're not, the condition is not that they're going to use. It was made a part of the application, which is part of the information we're considering. So that's <coughs> a part of what's being presented in order to justify the conditional use permit. You could you could propose an amendment to add that as a, as a specific condition. I'm not sure I want to do that. I'm just trying to figure out how you would enforce the conditional use in the future. If an applicant comes and says, as they did, this is something that um, they will be doing, they're bound, they're obligated to do it. Now, again, it can be made a, a specific condition as well. A comment. It's a matter of how it works. Thank you. Right. I mean, I, I agree with what Paul's asking and pointing out, but I think it, like every time we do a drainage conditional use permit and you've got uh, maintenance required for the socks and all that, all that kind of stuff, you kind of go out into a dead hole of you said you're going to maintain it you better maintain it you know it's not the staff's burden to go enforce it but you said you were going to maintain it right but I share Paul's concern but I don't think we have a fix for it <laughs> well the fix would be to make it a specific condition but um, it's a part it's a part of the application I mean if, if the board feels that that element of the, if the entire application hinges on that, then it, maybe it should be a, a condition. I think the fallback is that the condo association is going to manage I, it first. I do too. Yeah. I, think, I think you've got they're self actually self the policing. owners of the parking. Right. So, right. Uh, that's why I'm in favor of it. Yeah. It's, it's like icing on the cake, basically. Yes, Andrew. Yeah, in addition to both Paul and Jane's comments, I, it had a note that the um, fire and building inspector had to review the capacity and overall um, allowance for however many people were going to be permitted there so I think that's also another kind of governing constraint that we don't have to necessarily be concerned about because it's already built in to this uh, application so that makes me feel better it does <laughs> any other discussion all those in favor aye, aye. aye. anybody opposed one opposed Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is a request of Ash Chickory, as owner for property located at 90 FW Hartford Drive, requesting an after the fact wetland condition use permit in accordance with 10 1017 for the unauthorized removal of 28 trees within the wetland and wetland buffer area. This property is on assessor's map 
269 lot 45 and lies in the single residence B or SRB district. Who is here to present this application? Hi there, I'm Andrea Chickery. I live at 90 FW Hartford Drive. Um, I'm, be I'm here on behalf of my husband who unfortunately had to travel for work this week. Um, I'm here with a restoration plan um, to replace trees in our backyard. So we had taken some trees down um, and when the city approached us and let us know we were in the buffer, um, we stopped and then with the Conservation Commission, um, we kind of worked extensively with them. We had our own wetland scientists come in um, and this is the restoration plan that the commission um, agreed with and helped us plan um, that includes, as you can see in the plan, um, the 28 trees and then kind of the monitoring um, out for two years um, how to do it. So we're kind of here as the next step in our process. And I'm sorry, I had laryngitis earlier this week, so <laughs> I, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, so pretty much it. Okay, any questions for the applicant? Yes, Jane. Yeah, could you explain exactly why you needed to take down 28 mature trees? So um, the trees in the back were all clustered and were partially, they were either dead or in the process of dying, so some had split and were leaning on other trees. And then we have um, a now mobile toddler who plays all right in our backyard. And so when we have like giant limbs and branches constantly falling in our yard, we did it out of a safety concern. So we had cleared the trees that were either partially leaning, branches were split on, or were in the, in the process of being, of dying. So we came at it from a safety standpoint just because we had limbs and branches constantly falling in our backyard. And we have little kids on both sides of us and a neighbor's place set right next to it. And that we didn't, there were some trees that were already taken out by the previous owner. We didn't take out all the trees that were back there. There were stumps that were already there from our, the previous owner having taken them out because they were dead and dying. Andrew. Did you do the work yourself or did you hire a company? We had a company. Okay. How did you find out that it was a violation? I, we have no idea. The city showed up in our yard <laughs> and said we had a violation. So they informed us that someone called them and said tree work was being done. Um, so I'm guessing that's okay. how they knew. Well, it's unfortunate that it happened, but. We, we yeah. just, we, we didn't know. So as soon as the city informed us and showed us the map, we stopped and worked with them. Has, have I didn't notice that the state permits been granted? I, I, I don't know if, if there are any. <laughs> don't know. No. Okay. Any other questions of the applicant? Yes, Jane. You, you didn't know you were near a wetland. We were Jane, under the you, impression. Jane, you got to get up closer to your microphone. You, you didn't know you were, like, next to quite a large wetland. We were under the impression it was further back because when we bought the house, the conversation with the previous owner um, was that it started on the far back, very ed end of our property in the middle of the woods um, is where it started. And also our neighbor to the right, their yard actually extends well past where our tree line was. So that just led us to believe that the wetlands was further back than we thought. We thought it started in the very back, part, in the middle of the woods. I can see how it's. And can you tell me what size trees? You're, you're now, you've got seven trees, and I think there's a recommendation that you added to those number of trees. Yeah. How many trees and what size? 
are you going to replant? So with? there's 28 total. So there's 21 in the zero to 25 foot and seven in the 25 to 50. So there are maples, um, white pines, and then some blueberry bushes. Can you just repeat the sizes again, please? Um, I'm not exactly sure. I know when they go in, um, and it's in the, the diameters and inches are on the table one. Um, so they range anywhere from seven to 19 in diameter. Any other questions? Thank you. We're going to open the public hearing. Anybody here or on Zoom wish to speak to, for, or against this application? If you're on Zoom, raise your hand. Otherwise, we're going to close the public hearing. Nobody in the room. Close the public hearing. I'll make a motion that we vote to find the conditional use. Oops, yeah. Conditional use application meets the requirements set forth in section 10.1017.60 of the ordinance and adopt the findings of fact as presented. Second. Okay. Any discussion? I'd like to see more than two years. Um, okay. Next. These are, these are the uh, requirements first, and then I, th I think you're on number. Are you on number, number two? two? It's okay. We still have to vote. Yeah. So you're on. We need you're to, on the next. We need to vote on one. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed. Make a motion to vote the to grant the conditional use permit with the following conditions: two point one and two point two, two point three, two point four, and two point five. Second. Any discussion? Yes, Jane. Yeah, I, I'd like to see that the monitoring report, given the small size of these trees, relatively small, um, be expanded to more years than just two years. How many? Um, <laughs> let's say four years. Um, in order to demonstrate the 80% survival rate of the new plantings at least out to four years or maybe even five years, I'll say four, because mm -hmm. it's going to be important that those trees actually take root and stabilize that land so close to the wetland and that they actually do restore something that's been impacted so greatly with the removal of so many trees. So I think that that period of time should so be it's a, expanded. So it's a motion to revise 2.1 to four years from two. Mm -hmm. Is there a second for that? I'll second that. And I think you explained it. Would you like to explain it further, Jane? No. Uh, any other discussion on that amendment? Mr. Chair? Yes. Uh, it, it seems to me that based on how the applicant got to this point that two years of monitoring seems to be a little bit excessive to me. I, I mean, I'm, I'm comfortable with, with that amendment. 2.2 um, .2 talks about, uh, you know, the, the visual barriers, you know, at, at what point are we going to put visual barriers on every property at, at, at the wetlands boundary? Um, it, it just, it, the, the conditions in number two to me seem excessive for this applicant. Well, picking up on the, something I started to say earlier, there is a per diem fine provision in the zoning ordinance and state statutes, and it's it's pretty onerous. It's it's actually 550 for the first day and 275 for every day thereafter. <clears throat> so, in instead of pursuing that route. Um, I think what's been proposed in negotiations with the Conservation Commission and staff seems, I think we've got a balance. You feel it's too much, she feels it's not enough, so maybe it's Goldilocks. 
you know, I, I get the point. Maybe as proposed, that is. I have to imagine that, I mean, you know, it's unfortunate that this happened and, um, you know, all the questions in the world or comments in the world aren't going to, aren't going to get us back to where it was. There is a plan in place that has gone before the Conservation Commission. I am sure this has proven to be an unbelievably stressful um, happening uh, for the applicant and they have come forth with a plan that has been through Conservation Commission that is still difficult to and costly, I'm sure, to implement. And if we're looking to, I just don't feel like the, any further punishment is needed here. There's a, that's all. I don't want to make it worse. Yeah, and the trees and everything are going to be costly, yes, Beth. Um, I'm fine with the two years in this and mostly it's because of my own experience of having new trees planted on our property our new property that got built seven years ago and i can tell you one of them was replaced three times so it was all within the first year because it wasn't surviving so i think two years is going to be a really good time frame to show that it's actually gotten a root ball developed and it's really in, instilled in the ground and it's going to stay there so yes jane yeah i don't think that this is at all in the category of punishment for the applicant I'm concerned about our wetlands, and I'm concerned about stabilizing our wetland buffer. I also have a bunch of trees in my in my property, and it depends at what size you plant it, what it, where it's where you expect it to be at 80 percent of those surviving in two years. And where this has been really drastic, a drastic impact on this wetland buffer, I just think that the monitoring period should be extended in order to give the trees so that you can see that that property is actually being stabilized with regards to its buffering action. We have a motion on the changing from two years to four. Any other discussion on that? That's the only vote we're doing right yes. now, right? That's right. the only okay. vote Just wanted to make at sure. this point. All those in favor of the amendment? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Opposed. Opposed. Roll call. Mr. Simonis? No. Ms. Begala? No. I mean, yes. Yeah. For that amendment? <laughs> yes. yes. Uh, Mr. Giuliano? No. Uh, Councilor Moreau? No. Mr. Hewitt? Yes. Mr. Almeida? Vice Chair Mahana? No. City Manager? No. Chair? No, I guess I misheard it. Right. So, motion failed. Now we have a, I think we have the original, motion. Motion. original motion. We had an original motion to, and a second. second. So, any other discussion on the main motion? Yes. Yeah, I mean, really quick, I'll just point out, I think the solution here is twofold. One, we, as, long, as well as the Conservation Commission, as well as the city as a whole, like to create good stewards of the property, as well as even better stewards of property that abut wetlands, right? And it's a greater conversation that we've been having for many years. And so this experience for not only the property owner, but also a lot of those folks in the neighborhood, as the applicant mentioned, her neighbor's property extends back further. So it's really a learning curve as to where that wetlands begins. Uh, and the second part of that solution is educating um, a lot of the tree companies in the area, uh, much like we have our um, Snow Pro certifications where uh, plowing and landscaping companies know where not to plow because of wetlands. I think the same applies for tree companies in the area that need to uh, get educated as to where these wetlands begin because most frequently they are the ones that are telling the property owner which trees can and cannot be chopped down. So as much as it was a safety issue, I'm sure you know that alleviated a lot of concern. But at the same time, uh, we, I think as a city, can certainly uh, educate those who are stakeholders doing these projects to uh, avoid having to come in, in front of us like this because no one wants to do that and, and we certainly don't want to be the uh, punitive body that you know hands out these uh, discipline actions so ultimately you know two years is fine in my eyes because they could put the house on the market tomorrow and by law they don't have to tell anybody about this but you can be damn sure that they're going to because they don't want anybody else to run into these issues so whether it's you know the next homeowner or the neighbor up the street you know i think uh, this is a community solution that hopefully these homeowners will take very seriously and and i think that they will so 
Any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? None opposed. Thank you. Next item is a request of Martindale LLC as owner for property located at 99 Bow Street, requesting site plan approval to allow the expansion of an existing deck to include expanded seating for the business as well as public access to the Piscataqua River. This property is on Assessor's Map 106 as Lot 54 and lies in the character district or CD5, downtown overlay and historic districts. This property is located in Assessor's Map 106, Lot 54, and lies within the Character District CD5 again in the Downtown Overlay District. Who is here to present this application? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the Planning Board. John Shagnon from Haley Ward representing Martin Gale LLC. With me tonight is James Steinkraus uh, representing uh, Martin Gale LLC as attorney, Richard Desjardins, the project architect, Marie Bodie from uh, the management company and Mark McNabb, the applicant or representing as applicant for Martingale LLC. The property is at 99 Bow Street, tax map 106, lot 54. It's in the CD5 downtown overlay and HDC districts. And the project is to add two docks attaching to the east and west end of the existing dock. And there is currently a uh, float a docking float in the middle that uh, people can use to come to the facility and tie up on a temporary basis. The ends of the proposal are existing, are connecting to an existing overwater dock and all the work is over the water. So the plan set has a number of sheets, uh, just quickly a cover sheet uh, an as-built survey plan that shows the property dimensions, existing conditions plan, showing the location of the building and the existing docking and wharfing structures, the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services permit plan as the project requires permits from the state of New Hampshire for the work on the water. It has some site sections, uh, some details, and, and then architectural plans that include uh, a photo log plan, um, existing condition plan, existing elevations, and then uh, proposed perspective views, which I think aid greatly in looking at the uh, what the project's going to look like. Uh, sheet uh, A7 shows the proposed rendering of the public space. So part of this plan is to create uh, public space that is a part of the application and would be open to the public and is handicap accessible so that the public will be able to come to a portion of this expanded wharf and um, view the river and the goings on and uh, um, there's no barriers to that uh, uh, other than the usual uh, restrictions that would come with keeping the place safe. Also in the architectural plans are proposed elevations uh, view both of the dock side and the street side. And then there's a few sheets that talk about material selections and details relative to the um, fabric of the material that's going to be constructed on this expanded wharf. Speaking of the permit history, the Historic District Commission approved it in October 6th of 2021. Uh, an amended application was also approved in April of 2022. The Planning Board uh, approved the project in, on 30, uh, 30th of December in 2021. And the New Hampshire D, uh, DES wetland approval was obtained on October 27th. Uh, 2022. Uh, that did come after a uh, procedural um, um, correction to the record. Uh, this project received what is known as a shoreland exemption. It's typical that the um, municipalities are allowed to petition as a part of the Shoreland Protection Act to exempt certain areas of their communities from all of the rigors of the uh, shoreland protection rules 
and in fact the city of Portsmouth um, did make such a request for this area there are a number of facilities that are restaurants over water and uh, restaurants over water are not something that the state wants to approve routinely going forward but in this particular case the um, property was granted a shoreland exemption finally the governor and council approved the project on November 24th of 2023 um, and we're here because in the interceding time the planning board approval had expired so we put together a package of information it's essentially or exactly what was approved before also in your packet there is a uh, green building statement uh, wetland function and values report photo logs New Hampshire Heritage Bureau data check uh, and that uh, data check looks for endangered species and in this particular case the Atlantic and short-nosed sturgeon are a species of concern and the project is going to time its activity to avoid uh, any potential impact to that species as I mentioned the urban shoreling exemption uh, material is in the packet including the City Council review and uh, voting the Harbor Master approval is in there along with the New Hampshire uh, Department of His Historical Resources no impact statement copies of the local and state approvals and an updated egress plan that's pretty much the uh, package that you have before you if um, I'm going to turn it over but uh, before I turn it over to uh, James Steinkraus to talk about the um, comments from the public and uh, see a little bit more about the process if you have any questions about the plans themselves either for me or the architect we'd be glad to answer those I've got one on the east property line John could you just explain the where the boundary is on the east side maybe we could <coughs> zoom in on that sure that's a pretty good view there um, so if you look at the right side of the screen uh, I believe you're seeing the property line extended being pointed out by um, Mr. Stith the property line ends as you know at the mean high water line but right. the um, jurisdiction line for permitting by the Department of Environmental Services is the extension of that line but as we come back to Bow Street where is the property line with respect to the neighboring building uh, so if we look at the uh, as-built plan it's right after the cover sheet the property line depicted there by the surveyor record with James Vera shows it adjacent to the 109-111 facade as it comes away from Bow Street and then uh, there's a short section of building that is then as you go north uh, the Step building back. turns away from the property line and then uh, further down there's a appears to be a deck that juts back in close proximity to that property line Does that answer the question yes I didn't see any offsets but it looks like the boundary is for the first part almost right down the side of that building correct it doesn't specifically state that the building is the line and it's hard because the line is thick that it's, it's right there it's so. it's pretty much there yes okay thank you yep and is this application different than the one that was approved before no that's all I had for this um, is the square feet of the deck that's going to be added is it 9769 square feet uh, sorry I don't know off the top of my head um, there are two deck expansions the east side and the west side yeah my second question is what proportion of that is the west deck that will be of public benefit 
So I think we go to the. Oh, there we go. Thank you. The architectural plans detail it more than the site plans, but the eastern deck is 890 square foot, and that's uh, expanding the restaurant use, and the western is 344 square feet, which is the public use. I think there's uh, an exhibit up here showing the left being the smaller and the right being the larger. And the blue is the public area that is being dedicated. We, we have a number of last minute sent a butters letters um, that are objecting um, to this on, uh, on a number of fronts, including the fact that um, apparently at one point it was a different size than it's going to be now. So uh, I'm going to turn it over uh, to James Steincross. The, originally, the deck that is shown on the screen on the right was larger, and it was uh, moved back in the process. So there was a change, but it was a it was a shortening of that. And there also was a arc an arc bump out to the deck that was also removed. But I'm going to, if you don't mind, we'd like to com continue the presentation from the applicant. Oh, go ahead. I thought we were asking. Uh, good evening, Chair, Seamander, and Council uh, Land Board members. Uh, Jim Steinkraus with Rath Young Pignatelli on behalf of Martin Gale. And I'd just like to address some of the, the public comments uh, that I saw submitted uh, specifically by uh, Ms. Sherman, uh, one of the owners at 111, 109, 111 Bow Street. So this, this project has gone through an extensive public process, starting with HDC, TAC review, the planning board previously uh, with New Hampshire DES. And the, the proposed deck is over the state waters, um, as previously approved by the board on December 30th, 2021. Uh, Martin Gale submitted a wetlands permit to DES in July of 2021. DES initially denied the permit in May 9th, 2022. Uh, Martin Gale filed an appeal of that permit. Through the process of the appeal, uh, it was determined that DES had made an error in its decision. It was remanded back to DES, and they issued a permit on October 27th, 2022. Uh, there was nothing untoward. Ms. Sherman uh, participated in the process by filing an individual appeal to the Wetlands Council for that October 27th, 2022 permit in November 2022, uh, which sort of explains why there was a delay in the moving forward with the building permit process here. Um, that appeal was ultimately dismissed on, in August 17th, 2023. Um, and DES permit that was issued on October 27th, 2022 became effective or final. It then went to the governor and council for review and signature and approval which was done and effective by December 15th, 2023. So there was a public process all through to approve by DES and the state this project. Um, and the comments, and I'm not sure about some of the other written comments, uh, um, but Ms. Sherman did raise issues that have been raised in the past about trash for the property. The property is approximately 52,000 square foot, seven floor building, which is a mixed use building. There are the Martingale restaurant, but there are also two other restaurants that generate trash, approximately twice the volume of this property. Um, but that those dumpsters also handle, you know, multiple uses, including the tenants. Um, previously, and this was raised in December 30th, 2021 meeting, and the board had previously found that, you know, the trash complaints and oversight and compliance is really within the Board of Health's purview. Um, notwithstanding that, the prior approval had condition six, which essentially required the applicant to work with the city to mitigate any trash issues and complaints. And I believe there's a proposed condition 2.4, which is similar to that condition in the past. Um, Ms. Sherman also made reference to the residential nature of the neighborhood. However, the unit that she does own is, is used in office. So the issues with respect to noise and light complaints um, is, is not impacting her with respect to a residential use. Um, 
and you did reference the size of the deck. It was previously during the HTC process scaled back. Um, so it's more located more than 20 feet back from the property line um, and providing some additional buffer for any noise and light. And finally, one of the issues that was raised with respect to sea level rise and the recent uh, high water in January, um, the plans are required not only by DES, but are the plans that are submitted for review and approval by the city uh, do address sea level rise and is accounted for in the plans. So I just wanted to raise those issues. Were there any other issues that you'd like me to, to address with respect to any public comments? I know that's a pretty good overview, except I do wonder how by moving it 20 feet back, you really are mitigating noise in particular. Because I think she does have a point that this is going to increase capacity on the decks, at least seasonally. Well, it won't, I don't believe it'll increase capacity at the restaurant. It'll just, you know, move where people are sitting during normal business hours, in other words. You, you don't think it's going to increase capacity by adding a deck? Well, my understanding is the capacity of the restaurant won't change. It'll just simply change where people are sitting in the restaurant. I don't know. It doesn't yeah. say that anywhere that I've read. Thanks, though. Okay. How many seats in the restaurant do you know? Uh, off the top of my head, I don't know. Do <laughs> so I, I believe it's between 250 and 270. Total. 250 to 270? I believe so. Mr. Yes. Yes. Um, you obviously have read the Sherman's memo to, or the letter to the board, and, and they, they list quite a few issues they have, one of them being trash. And I see in, in the proposed approval conditions, that's the only thing that's mentioned. Has the uh, applicant tried to resolve other issues with the Sherman's, or can you offer any? Anything that can help us get by what the Shermans have complained about? Well, one of the complaints is the use of the trucks. I think there's a photo that's included, the trucks unloading. The, the trucks may or may not be loading just for that property. The trucks were located on the public street, and in the picture itself is actually shown in front of uh, the applicant's property, not in front of the condo. I believe that they have uh, in, installed a screen on the trash. Uh, they've gated it. Um, and maintain it. I, I'm not sure or aware that there's any other additional complaints that have been addressed. Um, I know they did raise issues about employees smoking uh, or more patrons smoking outside. If it is a public sidewalk outside the building. Um, uh, okay, thanks. Any other questions for this portion of the presentation? Your presentation complete? Did you want to add? Oh. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. We're going to open the public hearing. Anybody here or on Zoom wish to speak to for or against this application? <clears throat> Just name and address for the record. And first round is three minutes. Katie Evelyn Sherman, and I own one of the units at 111 Bow Street. But I need to remind everybody and them that it's the entire building that's against this. It's not just me. So um, you all received my letter. I wanted to note that in this letter, we address the site plan review regulation section 2.9 evaluation criteria um, with number three, the flooding, the picture I sent. Number six and seven, the grease traps that overflow regularly. And we saw a person that's paid by that building spraying the grease in between our buildings onto our AC compressors into the Piscataqua River. Um, number 10, our building is historical and the trash is pressed against our building still. They have a permanent structure now that's less than six inches from our historical building. Was that ever approved? I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, number 11 and 12, the trucks in the no parking zone, they do back up. They back up traffic on bow. Um, and number 13 and number 18, expanded seating means more noise. And if they're saying that they're not expanding their seating, 
are they going to close an indoor section during the busy summer months so that they don't increase seating? And is that a condition that the planning board will be making? Um, you read all of this. I'm going to read it again as quickly as I can. I'm Katie Eveland. I said all of that. Um, I think it's important that the Conservation Commission twice denied this. They have never approved this. DES denied it initially, um, and then they came back and approved it because of the appeal. And I believe this was because of procedural reasons, not the substance of our arguments. My res my, by the way, my unit can be residential, so it does affect my commercial and residential space. Um, the garbage from 99 Bow has been a, pr a problem since it expanded. It continues to be a huge issue for us, causing rancid odor, seepage, loud noise, and a rodent problem in our historic building. 99 Bow has repeatedly told the city and us and the health inspectors that they'll take care of this outdoor garbage problem. It's still a problem. They are supposed to have an indoor garbage area and this is the overflow, it's constantly full in the, the garbage receptacles that we can see. Um, the windows on that side of the building look out at trash now. If they open the windows, uh, it smells. I mean, you guys read all of this. We are, uh, we, we're getting beaten down. This has been a continual problem with some developers in this city. And I think it's important that you hear me. I don't have a eight attorney team with me. I am somebody that has lived here my entire life. I have this one unit in downtown Portsmouth, and it's, com it's very negatively impacted by what is there and what will be if you allow this to continue. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else wish to speak to for or against this application? If I might, I, I did want to correct the record. Um, I was wrong. The capacity is actually 322. 322? Not 270, sorry. The restaurant. Yeah, that's the max potential capacity. Thank you. I'm John Sherman. I'm Katie's husband. I'm an attorney. Uh, I, I have an active practice. I can't be spending all my time trying to address these issues with this uh, development. Um, they're here before you with this team and they don't know how many seats they have in the restaurant. They're here before you with this team and they don't know the square footage of what they're seeking approval of. This is, it's crazy. And it just seems like it's getting rubber stamped as the process is going forward. And if you look at what happened with DES, DES reviewed this and denied it. They denied it. They appealed, and as part of that appeal process, raised, I believe, the issue of the Shoreland Exemption Act. And with regard to the Shoreland Exemption Act, I don't know how much you guys know about this, but that whole approval process is flawed for a number of different reasons. There is supposed to be a plan for the city as a plan to develop shoreland protection. And there never was such a plan created or submitted, ever. And I want this to be on the record. John Bohenko, as the governor, or excuse me, as the mayor, was part of that process. And it was never submitted, yet they got a shoreland protection permit. When they then went to the Conservation Commission, as part of the process after they got that permit and requested for the first time approval of, do of decks, and I've submitted this three times to this board, the Conservation Commission, as a condition, said we'll approve deck here, but there is no more expansion allowed. And they agreed to that. They agreed to that. It's in the minutes. And they have now come back three times seeking expansion. The first time they sought expansion, they got it, and then it, they tried to file for a dredge and fill permit with DES, and they ended up withdrawing it because we appealed it. 
The second time they came here, you approved the expansion again. Conservation Commission denied it. The third time, Conservation Commission denied it. If there's going to be conditional, if, if the boards of the city are going to say, look, we'll approve this on certain conditions, and then they don't honor those, what do those conditions mean? That was an issue you've already addressed tonight about, oh, if a board, if an applicant says they're going to honor a condition, they have to honor it. And with regard to the mitigation activity, my wife mentioned it with the trash. There is a provision in their uh, terms of their operation that they are supposed to keep the trash in an indoor room away from the street. That's where the trash is supposed to be. There's a station along the street that they can move it to when they are disposing of it. That is not how they use this. And my wife mentions a window. The owner, the owner of the condo can't open the window because there's it's against a trash comp, trash barrels, and they want to expand this use. With regard to the appeal that was filed uh, of the uh, second approval, which was a complete reversal of the first denial, that was uh, dismissed for procedural reasons. DES did not consider in any way, shape, or form any substantive argument from us. And in fact, what happened is we appealed their order granting them the dredge and fill, which was I call the reversal order. We appealed it. My wife actually appealed it. And they found that because my wife was not an attorney, she couldn't file an appeal on behalf of the condo association, which is how she had named the appeal document on behalf of 111.0 condo association. They also found that although she had signed that appeal document as an individual owner, that it wasn't actually submitted on behalf as, as an individual. Okay, if you, if so, you want to continue, you're supposed I'm to go around. I am wrapping up right now, I'm sorry. I just, my point is, it was not a substantive discussion or substantive basis for the denial of the appeal. DES never considered that. And so finally, there will be a time, I suppose, when they have to go back to the Conservation Commission again. And if I, I imagine Conservation Commission is going to deny it perhaps for a fourth time. So we just ask you, please, please, no, this is a huge effect on the property values of the residences at 111 Bow Street, and it's setting a horrible precedent. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else wish to speak to for against this application for the first round? Anybody wish to speak? Second round. If I may briefly uh, respond to Mr. Sher Attorney Sherman. Um, the appeal, the, the permit was granted by New Hampshire DES, which has jurisdiction over this deck. It is over state waters. The wetlands, uh, the, not wetlands, but the Conservation Commission uh, did vote against it, but that is advisory to the state's decision on the permit that grants the use of this deck or additional seating for the restaurant. So I did correct for the record the number of uh, seats and capacity for the restaurant, as well as the square footage uh, for the building. And the appeal was filed incorrectly by Ms. Sherman and was dismissed because she filed it as on behalf of all the owners, similar to her comments tonight. And in fact, it was her and the state found that she was not authorized to file those comments on behalf of the entire condo association. So it was dismissed. The permit became final after August 17th, 2023. It was then approved by the governor and council through public process and effective as of December 15th, 2020. So the permit is final. DES permit of its approval is final. And I would not expect any further um, permits or approvals uh, before the Conservation Commission. So thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, members of the Planning Board, I'm Mark McNabb. Uh, I just want to address a few things that are not correct. Yeah, speak in the first round. I didn't speak Martin Gale. Uh, Mr. McNabb, you didn't speak the first time. I'm sorry. You're supposed to speak during the first round. Oh, I do. I can't speak on the second. Your representatives can, but you have to speak during the first round to speak in the second or the third round. 
Okay. That was that was the rule. I don't know if you're in the room. I re reread the rules at the beginning of the meeting tonight. I'm not aware of it. <clears throat> Second time. Go ahead. Th yep, thank you, John. <clears throat> John Chagney again. Just um, to correct the record because I've kind of been around here for a while. Uh, when the Shoreland rules came into effect, the Shoreland 1983, they created, the state created the Shoreland Protection Program, which was in addition to <clears throat> the program that had been in place for the tidal buffer zone. It extended the, the reach of protection to 250 feet. They created the Shoreland exemption for communities that were on bodies of water that would want to create exemptions. So in particular, at the time, you could not cover more than 35% uh, uh, of the lot with impervious surface. And there were communities like Portsmouth, Laconia, uh, communities that are on the edge of water bodies where the, it's very developed. Uh, the development in the zone <coughs> along the Piscata River is by the city's own zoning, you can do 95% coverage of the law. So the state allowed for communities to intercede and request that their downtowns essentially be given an exemption to the shoreland rules. The city of Portsmouth at the time, Dave Holden, planning director, thought about that and had a conscious discussion and decided that they would not approach it as a city, but that if individual property owners wanted to ask for an exemption, that that's the vehicle. So to say that the city never had a plan, the city did think about it, and the city decided not to just do an overarching exemption in the waterfront area. Thank you. I might just couple quick points. Um, first, with respect to the loading zone in front of the building at 99 Bow Street. Apparently the loading zone for most of that area of Bow Street for all the other restaurants, including Surf, Surf Room, the River House, as well as Martin Gale, are all utilized that area for loading on that street. There is extensive refrigerated trash rooms in the basement and the second level, mezzanine level of the building, uh, as well as internal recycling cans and use inside the building that is then transferred outside to that site, and I'm informed that that trash location outside is approved. The trash generated from Martingale is much less than the trash generated by the surf and surf room restaurants. And finally, the 322 is required and limited by the fire code uh, for occupancy of the restaurant, so that will not change. Unless other changes are made, but that is, as of right now, that's the limit, so they would have to move people in and out to stay within that 322. Thank you. Thank you. Second, next second round speaker. Yeah, I'll be, I'll be brief. I know you know the issues, but he, what Attorney Steinkraus just mentioned is the trash and, and the other businesses using it, but this is, they're increasing the size of this restaurant significantly. They don't know the number of seats, but the square footage is 9,000 square feet. Under any, who, no matter who uses the trash at that building, it's going to be increased, and that problem exacerbated and it's not warranted. With regard to just the public benefit here, I have to reiterate, I've raised this three times with this board. This is the third time. That is a ruse. If you are believing that this is gonna be a public benefit to have this deck, if you are believing that this is gonna provide a benefit to handicap access, you are not understanding what is going on here. If you put up their plan, you'll see, in the public access space, they have two tables two large circular tables they, which they are putting in the public space. That is not going to be public meeting space. They have public space there right now. They were <coughs> asked at the last historic district planning board meeting, what are you using the public space for right now? And they testified to the board, we are using it for as a waiting area and we also have patrons there. It is not public space. Their patrons are standing there. They also made it clear at the last meeting, despite the fact that it was approved, that they have control over who accesses that public area. 
It's not public space. They open it, they close it, they lock it, they're going to dictate when it's used. That is not public space. And with regard to handicap access, it sounds great. We all want handicap access on the waterfront. They were required to put in elevators as part of the construction of that building by federal law. So when they now say, oh, we're going to allow handicap access, they were required to do that. So don't use that as a bootstrap to expand the scope of their deck. That's like saying, oh, I was required to do something, so I should, allowed, I should be allowed to expand my business. That's a, that's a great thing, but that's not a reason to expand the deck, which they're only using to expand their business, which is going to drastically affect everyone else to their detriment. Thank you. Thank you. Any other second round, <clears throat> excuse me, second round speakers? I think just for point of clarification, if Peter, you can bring up the, the plan, the shows I think, that. I think we're starting the third round speakers. Any other second oh, round sorry. speakers? Just you stay they there. Count you can stay there. Are there any other second round speakers? Okay, third round speakers. Sorry. Just the. Uh, Five Just a, minutes. a point that the um, the circular items on the blue public deck are not tables; they're planters. Right. I'm told by the uh, project architect. And then part of the public access, which is through the building, through the elevator, so that you can come from street level to get to the public space. Uh, by doing that, the landowner is committing to providing and keeping that access through the building, which is um, a public benefit. It's not because, uh, yes, you need elevators for buildings, but to commit to putting it there and keeping it there is a, another level of commitment to the public space. We don't do questions. Very good. Sorry. I'll, I'll hold it. Yep. You're we, right. We, we can talk. Yep. He says he's committing to it under his control. That was their testimony. They have, they locked the gate. They control the gate. They control the access. He's committing to letting people who are patrons to his restaurant go in and use that space when he says so. That's not a public deck. That's not public space. That's space that Mark McNabb's going to use for a business at his discretion. Any other third round speakers? Anybody on Zoom? No one on Zoom. Last call for third round speakers. I'm going to close the public hearing. Is that a question? Of um, could you put the deck, I'm sorry, the, the drawing you just took off, could oh, you put sorry. that back up when you get a chance? So my question is the blue area on the plan. Can I go down to that blue area as a member of the public when the restaurant is closed, when the restaurant is open? Um, if the rest of the deck is locked off, can I go down onto that deck at any time as a member of the public? Again, through the stairway, because that, that's one of the conditions of the easement. Well, that's what I'm asking. There's no. Oh, in sorry. order in order to have public comment, I think I have to look at our new rules. I think there needs to be a vote of the board to allow that. Hang on. This is this this could be different. Just hang on a second. Yeah. Give me two seconds. This is so new. We can't. If the board wishes to ask questions, we'd have to have a suspension of the rules, which would require a 6-3 vote. Or in this case, a two-thirds vote. We don't have nine at the moment. I'm just seeking information. It doesn't matter who answers it, to be honest with you. Um, well, I can tell you from the prior application, because I was here, 
one of the conditions was to have a public access easement from Bow Street down the stairway to that blue space. That is clearly, and the blue space was included. The condition also states ADA access. But to me, that sounds like access to and through the elevator. Hours of operation aren't specified. Um, they could be. Yeah, my intent, my, my, the intent of my question wasn't to write, the, I, I understand the elevator access. Um, I would not expect to be able to enter that building if it were closed and ride the elevator. That, that, would be, that wouldn't be reasonable. I'm asking if I can go down the stair or even enter from the other side, which probably isn't, you know, he has, doesn't have control of the, the entering through the, Dianus, jump in here, I know, but let me just finish. I, I'm, I'm really talking about going down the stair to that blue deck. Um, 32A, 2.1A. Okay, sorry, my laptop <coughs> ran out of battery, so I can't see that on my phone. There is mention of it. Please go ahead. <laughs> we actually had an extensive conversation when we first approved this back in 2021, mm -hmm. and the extensive conversation was we wanted to make sure there was at least access. We might not have 24 hours a day handicap access, but yes, you will be able to get to the public section on foot by stairs, by the ramps if you can get through the easement from you know, the other restaurants. Down so you can get to, so the handicapped access won't be 24 hours a day, but there is access. Thank you. Ask so to guess, continue this discussion, we really, we really need a motion. I make a motion that we vote to find the site plan application meets the requirements set forth in site plan regulation section 2.9 evaluation criteria and adopt the findings of fact as presented. Second. Now we can have all the discussion we want. Well, do you want to do that and then move on to the next vote and then discuss? <laughs> Before we <laughs> so, yes, Jim. This motion just made was for, for the findings of fact? Correct. Okay. This is just the findings of fact. Findings yes. of fact. The first, of, it's always a two, it's two part. Two, two stages. This is the, usually the easier one to use an expression. Any discussions on the findings of fact? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? None. I will continue to make the motion to vote to grant site plan approval with the following conditions mm. 2.1 through 2.7. Is there a second? I'll second. Now in discussion on that made us uh, new. Um, this is something that we've actually uh, approved before, and I remember all of the discussions we had around trash and it was very clear that trash is is part of our original site plan but if what's there isn't working that we really need to ask the staff including the health inspector um, to go out and just make sure it's the way that it was approved, originally approved and that it was going that it was being maintained appropriately so I think that those are the avenues to take when there's issues regarding a site plan approval, or you know, when there's an issue with a site plan as it's been approved. Um, capacity, they're not allowed to increase capacity. So even though they might be increasing outdoor capacity, the indoor capacity decreases if the outdoor capacity increases. So it has to be no more than what they're allowed to have, even though there might be more seating available. Um, I actually, for six years, worked out of this building uh, that ended in about 2018, so it's been a while. So I'm very familiar. My office window is right over where the trash is kept. So um, I'm aware of the issues, but it's it's downtown. There's always a lot of noise. That's why I moved out of downtown. It's very quiet where I am now, and nobody bothers me. It's great. So when you are downtown, sometimes you have to put up with some of the things that go on downtown. And it works for some people. It doesn't work for others. Um, I, I don't see an issue with approving this a second time where it's already been approved once. It's nice to know the other approvals have come through. And I think there are other avenues for some of the issues that are going on. If I could just speak to my second. Um, I want to, um, I want the um, abutters to be sure that I do not take um, this, their comments lightly. I also live downtown, very close to this location. Um, I have also lived in my um, location for decades and am very sensitive to the high energy levels of downtown and being a resident there and noise and waste and just the sometimes the insane levels of of energy that, that downtown has as its character. So I, I do not 
take your concerns lightly. If this building owner is violating any rules, whether they be uh, in the noise ordinance or the handling of waste or the loading dock, um, I'm sorry, the, the commercial um, vehicle drop-off area, there's there are avenues to enforce that. Um, I, I just, um, I want you to know that I hear your concerns and uh, um, I share those concerns for downtown residents in the midst of all of this energy. It's it's a hard, it's, sometimes it's a, it's a very exciting place to live, obviously, but it's at times it's a very hard place to live, for sure. Jim. Uh, Mr. Stith, uh, can you confirm that the Conservation Commission denied this application three times? I don't know about the three times. I know the first time the deck went to them most recently, they recommended denial to the for the state permit. The state. Okay, so at least two times they denied it? I mean, I mean, did not approve it? They recommended denial to the state. Okay, so that's at least twice? Yes. Okay, thank you. Paul and then Jane. Go ahead. Um, during the discussion phase, can I ask a question of the applicant? Not without a special Go vote on. of the Thank board. You. Okay. We might be able, I mean, Beth and I were both here at the prior application, so might be able to help you. Uh, no, no withdrawal. Okay. Hey, I, I just, my comment is I am worried about the fact that the vote from the Conservation Commission is from 2021 according to our application materials, so it's quite old. Um, and I think that they should take a look at this configuration and these issues over the water. I mean, noise travels more over the water. And so it's, it's very confusing to me to be approving something where the capacity is 322 people, but actually the business can shuffle those people around any which way on any given day. So we don't actually know what number we're approving to be out on these new decks. And especially because the application says additional seating, but then in the discussion we're saying, no, it's not really additional seating when you look at the overall capacity. However, it is additional seating if the deck is expanded, at least during warm summer months. That is very obscure, the way this is presented. Um, so I do believe that there is going to be an increased noise, impact of noise, that's more than just living in a regular, you know, downtown location that's not near the water and not near these decks. Um, you have to believe that this is going to be more than that. This is not just going to be the noise of traffic or trucks. I'm, I'm concerned about the noise levels for people who did move into places that are residential, a balance needs to be struck. Um, and I think the trash should be totally contained inside and just have more trash pickups. It's really that simple so as, not, so as to be a good neighbor to residents in that area. Um, but I'm, and, and finally, I'm concerned about hours of operation because it's mentioned in the application, but we don't know what the hours of operation are. And I think in such close quarters, again, with residents right there over the noise, over the water, which can actually augment noise, there should be reasonable hours of operation, um, which the business is not going to want to do in the summer on a Saturday night. I know that. I, I think that we need to stipulate something about limited hours of operation in fairness to the comments we have from residents. And um, I think we should also recommend to send this back to the Conservation Commission. I would like to hear their opinion at this point. We have a very old opinion from them and many denials. I'd just like to point out the Conservation Commission is not advisory to us in this specific application because it's only for site plan. They're advisory to the state 
because we're not issue they only advise us on wetland conditional use permits and this isn't what we're issuing so I but just wanted to make sure that was understood we can still request that the Conservation Commission look at this can't we from they're not they're not site plan reviewers so I don't think so so I think technically we need to remember what we're looking at here this is an accessory use to a permitted use downtown um, they're allowed up to 500 seats in this zone as a matter of right I just checked I thought that was the case that's why I asked the question earlier to find out how many seats are in this restaurant so if there is a small expansion on the deck because chairs are shuffling around there's plenty of allowance here under what's permitted as the principal use which is the restaurant what we're looking at is an accessory use on a deck and we've looked at uh, the prior condition that is in the proposed conditions for access down to the from the Bow Street down to that space has to be dedicated in the form of an easement so it has to be shown on the plan and as a part of a recorded instrument so that would be that will be covered uh, you know I live downtown too I lived on Richards Avenue for 10 years I lived downtown for 10 years it's a very different place downtown and I hear what you're saying I hear what Jane was saying but it's part of the it's part of the mix you live downtown if you live next to a permitted use you you can expect you can have a 150 seat bar next to this property as a matter of right so it's um, it's the downtown you know and I agree with what Joe said if there are violations of you know specific regulations there are avenues that aren't a site plan planning board site plan issue they're more coats office and health office and other departments of the city um, I'm comfortable with what we did before and as it's been proposed tonight especially again it's an accessory use to a permitted use we're not talking about putting a restaurant in the middle of a residential zone you know single-family residences that's not what we're talking about here so, Paul does the um, public access include all the way to the water to the floating dock uh, both from the water and from the deck so that's what the blue area the west on the end of it right the western end floating docks up there. So it's just that would not be accessible right the blue area shown on the map yeah. There's a lot of the way there. the way the condition proposed condition is worded it would go from the street to the blue include the blue area yep. so anything out anything different than that would be a different condition or in addition to that condition then if the public dock is deck is such a selling point there should be signage on the front on the street side you know inviting the public to publicly view the river down there um, so that it has a full utility a full ability to be used by the public it's probably in there but I'm still yeah. stating that that's very important that we see that it's condition 2.5 yeah 2.5 Any more discussion? We have a motion and a second to approve with the conditions as noted. Any changes to that? All those in favor? Excuse me. I have oh. my hand up. Um, I, I still want to discuss hours of operation if we can put some kind of limiting factor in as a condition. You could propose that as a motion. As, get, as I said, the principal restaurant this is an accessory use of existing restaurant so we can't control the restaurant I don't think that would be appropriate but you can propose it if you want to propose it I'm about to call the vote so. yeah I'm just looking at all the conditions there's eight conditions and mm -hmm. it's rather complex I'm not going to propose it because I can tell from the vibe it'll just be shot down but I, I not very happy that we can't accommodate residents in a balance with commercial property 
So let's go straight to the vote now. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Two opposed. Thank you. Thank you for opposing. Um, call a 10-minute break.
call the meeting back to order. Next uh, item on the agenda, I believe, is the EV. It is. It is. Situations mm. from hell. Mm. Oh. So, feels really bad for It's also a public hearing, isn't it? It will it be is. a public hearing, yeah. That was better. Began as a request from City Council quite some time ago, and it has been through several iterations, including most recently with the legal department, and that's basically what you have in front of you. You have the sort of the progression, but um, you want to go through it quickly, Peter? Sure. Um, so at, at the February 29th meeting, we had a draft that was voted to send a public hearing after a legal review. Uh, the chair and I have since sat down with legal and reviewed it and made some changes. The substance is still there, but we just kind of condensed it and kind of cleaned it up and made it a little more, um, I think, user-friendly and by adding a definition for an EV fueling space one and two to distinguish between what is customarily um, found in a residential electric service would be an EV fueling space one, and then anything greater than that would be an EV fueling space two. These are not to be confused with the level one, two, and three chargers, chargers that are and standards four. and four now since we've been working on this. <laughs> um, that makes me laugh. It's just to discern between what is customarily found in a residential house versus a commercial or mixed use building that might have a higher uh, electric service. Um, so it was really cleaning up from the February 29th version. So we would recommend that the the motion, the uh, draft that is labeled 314 be uh, recommended to city council for first reading. But we can go through it if you have questions. I, or... I have a broad question. So, in our work sessions and everything, I mean, I think I can just speak for all of us because it was unanimous that levels one and two. I know you said right, right. drop that for a second, but no problem residential because it's 110, 220. That's but mm -hmm. we had also agreed that level three, if we were going to touch it, needed some restrictions. So, how does this? So, in, in the use <laughs> tables. Um, That's where I'm at. Right. That's where I'm at. So a motor vehicle service station could have any type of power. That would be like a, a station for the principal use would be for charging. Got it. Makes that sense. That could be a level three. Yep. As an accessory use. That's a conditional use permit and most, right. under most of those see up top. Yep. As a principal use. Yep. Right. Gotcha. And that, that's changed from special exception to conditional use permit. The accessory uses, uh, we have a new EV fueling space one, and that would be something that you, you would have at your house, which would be, you know, your 220 service mm -hmm. outlet. That's permitted across the board. Um, an EV fueling space two would be something more that's like a level three that we're thinking about. But I sort of kind of lost that in your definition of EV space, fueling space two, because the definition didn't really help me with that. Because I, so I, I did look at that and went back to your definition. Yep. And so that has um, charging support equipment that uses greater than customary residential electric service. So it would be a higher service, like a four, you know, greater than a 220 mm -hmm. um, that you wouldn't find in a house, typically. Okay. I, is the wording confusing? Because uh, is it, would you say spec to? You're not meaning level two, <coughs> right. right? Right. So should should it be spec A and B or space should it be space two? Space. Which space really threw me off because I was like, are we talking one or two parking spaces? And so if I look across 19.7, there. So I don't have my list. It's in my bag here. I got it. But you know, you it's permitted in in commercial zones. Well, that's fine. We like that. Commercial mixed use zones. We like that. But gateway one and two, it's permitted. Right. That's. But we all agreed that you don't want to hear it, see it, or and we and we don't want to be near a level three charger. Residentially. Not the charger. The. Well, as a, as a principle, it's a conditional use thing. in gateway, Thank and you. it's permitted as an accessory. 
in Gateway. But so what that's saying. Correct, I, I hear what you're saying, but yeah. just so we correct your I'm wrong. So I'm going to take I'm going to take Holloway building Holloway uh, Cadillac. Mm -hmm. We're going to tear it down because it's now Gateway, and we're going to put commercial on the first floor and three floors of residential because that's permitted. Mm -hmm. And we're going to drop a uh, level three charger in the parking lot. That don't work for me. I mean, I, I last two weeks ago I rented a rented an EV by mistake because <laughs> it's eight o'clock and Hertz gives me a freaking Mercedes that's electric and I don't know about it. And I tried to drive the stupid thing for nine days, and it's a piece of junk. And when I went and found one level three charger, which I had to because I had to drive seventy miles to a job interview. I parked next to this thing for 25 minutes and listened to it, recorded it, felt it vibrating, and got my bill. No way would I want that next to it. It was out in that far netherlands of a Walmart parking lot. where it, Was it noisy? Yes. And it was Charge America. It was noisy. It was vibrating. It was, I, I wouldn't want it within 50 feet of a residence. And it was in the nether, it was on the okay, outside well that, that's, of a. That's not in here. It was in the outside of a Walmart parking lot. Where it should be, <laughs> um, but doesn't and I think, this, I know doesn't we have this, at least one person wants to talk about this. So, well, I guess my question was, didn't am I not right that you just said Gateway One, Gateway Two, we can put a Level Three charger there as an accessory use? So the idea that was means for the residents or the or the patrons of the businesses on the first floor. It could, yeah, it could be. But where do we address how far it is? Because, like I just said, three hundred feet from the front door of a Walmart was fine with me. But well, not not on a not on one of those parcels that we rezoned two weeks ago, within twenty five feet of the front door. Okay, well that's what you're. That's my about point. That was my only real point about this because yep. that was the yep. only fuss that we were talking about. Mm -hmm. No level threes in residential or within a distance. So the conditional use permit would cover that because under as, a, as principal use. So because that would get into placement and yep. noise yep. and all that but the problem what you're saying would be under 1970 correct permitted correct the ones the p's the gateway because general business that's okay probably maybe but gateway one gateway two we've just established as mixed uh residential. so in mixed use zones you might say have those as conditional use as well yeah because then you have some control about the setbacks or you know okay. distance from and things like noise and, and and the size of the fence that needs to go around them and stuff like that uh, Andrew and then Beth. I think you probably maybe. I just want to play devil's advocate, but do we want to force them to do a conditional use permit for level one and level two? Definitely not. Well. So that's all. <laughs> so only, totally. only level three. I, uh, Throw that into the mix for conversation. <laughs> and it may be answered in here, and if it is, I apologize for clogging this up, but my mind goes to the mobile station and the other gas station on Islington Street where there are residences right, right there. Behind them. And so. Level uh, two, though. Right, so I'm just being cognizant of that disruption, if any at all, and also if someone comes before us with a level three application in that area, um, you know, how can we be proactive about at least uh, creating awareness for not only the property owners, but also the, the abutters? Um, it's something that is unfamiliar to the city as well as property owners, so we don't want to, you know, have these applicants come before us and then us shut down every single one. Like, I just want to have clarity to the point where uh, people can read this and say, oh, you know, here's level one, level two, level three. And, and from there, we are not uh, in great debate through an application process. It's a very clear cut path or lack thereof. <clears throat> exactly. And, and so like Walmart down by my house, Got a perfect place. Put, Got one, put one out by route one. Well, we could do what I said, or you could also put in a distance restriction for residential. You could say permitted as accessory provided more than 100 feet from residential. Yeah, honestly, I think that's the simplest solution right yeah, there. Yeah. Rather than go broad, go narrow, 100 feet from residential. Speaking of meeting some more. So I'm very confused by what our overall strategy is. Uh, it, this actually in combination with what's been done recently on housing and the gateway uh, districts. The, the, in those cases, we're trying to figure out how to put more housing in, in, in places that's appropriate to housing. Uh, here, 
the history has been that we've not put gas stations in residential districts. And, and these things may not be gas stations, but they're not too far away, and particularly in the level threes. And so here we've got a proposal that it not even be discretionary, but that it be authorized by, by right to, to put one of these level three chargers into areas that we are pushing toward having housing. Uh, some districts that already have housing, but then also kind of additively in these gateway districts. So I, I, I don't understand the strategy of, of the relationship between things that are antithetical to housing and housing. Uh, those are, they seem to contrast to me and, I, and the proposal seems to exacerbate uh, what could be a bad situation. That's why we're having this conversation because, you know, more heads knows things that fewer heads don't. So, you know, point well taken. Um, do you want to talk more or want to hear from our very patient member of the public and then continue our conversation? Please, that'd be great. Let's open the public hearing. And I emphasize the patience of our... Do I get to go first? <laughs> yes, yeah. sir. You can, you can have low... You can have... I saw what happens if you don't get up for round one. Yeah. <laughs> I learned a couple of things tonight. <laughs> uh, Tom Morgan, 39 Richards Avenue, uh, Portsmouth. And I come here tonight with a couple of questions for you about your proposal and a few comments. Um, and I also like to say I'm pleased that you guys are moving in the right direction. Uh, it's been a long way. I don't know if you're aware, I think some of you are, New Hampshire is the only city in the state that has no level three chargers. And primarily it's a problem of your zoning ordinance, but I think you guys are on the verge of fixing that. So my first question is um, from your March 14th proposal Page 10-2 <coughs> looks like this. I see you, you've introduced uh, generators into the conversation. So my question is, what is the purpose of the generator? And do you really want to have this in your EV charging ordinance? I've never seen an EV charger with a generator next to it or plugged in or anything. I think somebody here is, um, doesn't understand technology. So you probably want to get rid of that. I've actually seen a diesel-powered diesel powered EV charger. You have? Yeah. I okay. thought it was ridiculous. <laughs> All right. Other question is, I noticed when the City Council sent their uh, proposal over to the Planning Board for comment, they were addressing EV charges in all 28 zoning districts. This um, proposal you have before tonight only addresses, um, did I say 24 or 28? 28. 28, yeah. You only have 24 here. Pease has fallen off the um, equation, and I was wondering if that's an oversight or if, or if that was on purpose. There's four zoning districts out of Pease. Well, this isn't supposed to be interactive, but I think they're all included for uh, residential. Right, but City Council asked you to comment on the four P's. No, we did. I didn't see that here. Well, I think, anyway, <laughs> go ahead. What's your next? Uh, next comment is, uh, back in 2013, the, the city kind of created a problem for EV charges because they put it under the umbrella of motor vehicle service stations. I think the thought at the time was gas stations and EV chargers were kind of the same, and that in the future, remember we're talking 11 years ago, when EV chargers came into demand, they would be installed in gas stations. And I think that's why the city did what they did at the time. In hindsight, that was a mistake, because as we... Very cool. <laughs> Round two. <laughs> <laughs> You're up. 
<laughs> yeah, so so I, I don't think that's a good approach. I think uh, part, of, part of the city's problems emanated from that move in 2013 to treat EV chargers and gas stations the same because they're quite different. And, and one of the, the repercussions was that then is now you only allow gas stations in four zoning districts, which is appropriate. But, you know, you shouldn't be putting those same restrictions on EV charges. And I see by your use table proposal you're not. So um, I was hoping you would abandon this concept of putting disparate land uses under that umbrella. But I see you've expanded it. You're not only not abandoned it, but you've expanded it. You're, you're talking about um, battery swap and convenience stores as well. And I guess my recommendation would be treat all these disparate uses as disparate uses, as different. Make different rules for each. When you try to have, you know, four disparate pieces fit one, you know, like one, you're not going to be able to effectively regulate any one of the four. So this, what it's worth, I recommend that. The other comment I had is fire safety. EV electric vehicles very rarely catch on fire, but when they do, it's pretty nasty. Mm -hmm. And one place you don't want to have that fire is an enclosed space, such as an underground parking garage. Mm -hmm. I know already mm -hmm. we've, the city's issued permits for that sort of thing here. So I'm just bringing that to your attention so that you guys can make sure that um, before you, the city issues permits in an enclosed space, you get the fire chief or somebody from the fire department in on the conversation. I didn't see that in the proposal. And my other comment was off-street parking. Um, off-street parking has been an impediment at times to the installation of EV charges. I think this latest version recognizes that problem, but I'm not sure because the wording is kind of ambiguous. It says, if you look on page um, It doesn't have a page number, but the Article 11. See, one of the more recent amendments was requirement is EV fueling spaces one and two may count towards minimum parking requirements. I'm not sure what that means. I, I'm guessing that your intent is to give the EV charger and the equipment a free pass, which you should. They should be exempt. But, you know, the wording is so ambiguous that I'm if I'm not sure what it means, I think there'll be other people not sure what it means. You could you could clarify your intent here. I think that would be a good idea. The way I read it is that the charging station counts as a parking space. Yeah. Simple as that. Is That's that right. right. And what about what about the equipment that goes with it? The inverter and the transformer. See where you where you're going to run into problem and you have in the past is if you're out there in the middle of the parking field, they have to put it somewhere. Typically, they'll, they'll take up a couple or three parking spaces. And if your parking lot is only just big enough to meet the terms of the ordinance, then, then you, you put the property in violation. And the city says, no, you can't do that. That's, that's the way to, yeah, it it's not only happens, it happens a lot. And it happens here, too. It happened in 2017. Well, if you put transformers that take up parking spaces, <coughs> those would take up parking spaces. And yeah, so, I mean, the way the so you have to put the transformer somewhere else. Hmm? Put the transformer somewhere else, not in the parking field. Yeah, and, and, and that's the easy way to do it. Sometimes, though, um, it, it doesn't work that way. These chargers have to be in proximity to the electric service. Otherwise, you're going to dig up a trench across the parking lot to get to the electricity. I'd say if that were the case, then the parking count goes – by default, it's, 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 it's eliminating parking spaces, and that's right. the, the applicant would have to make them up, correct? Yeah, the idea was where you're putting a, because some, some jurisdictions don't allow you to count a parking spot for an EV vehicle as a parking space. So we thought it was being more permissive to allow it. Well, well, if you're forcing the applicant to um, expand the parking lot, that's that's going to kill a few deals, you know, because that, that's going to increase the expense. Well, it's a question of, you know, some parking lots have islands, as we, as you well know. That yep, and that's, that's, yep. 
you could put a transformer there that's not on a parking space. That's that's the easy way to do it. Sometimes you don't have that option. Well, you know, we can't solve everything. Um, but what I'm what I'm I, suggesting is that you adjust the language so that you exempt the, the equipment from the from the count. A full exemption for all EV equipment and the parking spaces. Yes. Understand. Understand the recommendation. Okay. That's it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we have Tom's comments. We have the distance issue on. Uh, by the way, we weren't making it up. There are now level four chargers, and I haven't looked this week. There could be level five. Um, it's happening that fast. And level fours are twice as much voltage as level three. Which means more noise. So they're really fast and. You don't want to stick your finger in the socket. Hydrogen is already alive in Asia. <clears throat> Speak to the peas omission is because we don't we, we can't don't. change the peas <coughs> We could you could make a recommendation to the PDA that they uh, I, <coughs> I wasn't even gonna mention right, so we, we that's why we, we, we can only really, it's go. not even worth trying. Right. So you know. They make their own regulations. Yeah, peas is peas. Right. Do we want to change um, the, and the, it was actually the legal department suggested the uh, feeling space one, feeling space two. I get the confusion given the uh -huh. well, I, I, labeling. Rather than change the label, just it could be a and B. Refine the definition. It could just be A and B. Yeah, well, yeah, A and B would be better because I immediately and Then there's not going to be confusion because right. we, one we were working on it and, yep. you know, so if we change that to A and B, and then uh, if fueling space is B, not within 100 feet of a residence without a C. And I don't really know the right number. I just know what last time we talked about it, we were really, we felt really good about level one and level two chargers. Right. And then we tried to address level three chargers. Help me out, Peter. Do we have a distance from residence for any other? We have it for a, for a motor vehicle. If it was a principal use, we do. What's it, what is that distance? It's um, it varies. It might be two fifty. Let me see. I, I know this has come up. <laughs> it came up with the Cumberland Farms on Lafayette Road. I think it's fifty feet. You can't Cumberland for it. what? For what, Beth? Cumberland uh, fuel station because of how close it was to the um, Ellen Park. Yes, it was closer on the corner right there. Yep. There's a house it right was, behind it. Yes, it was thank you. Too You're close right. to a residential neighborhood. You're right. Um, yeah. Well, I, I was more focusing on the stuff, Rick, you got way into the tech of, and, and then we saw pictures of the sticker, you know, you're not supposed to stand near them. And, and then, of course, we did have controversy. Some of the big ones are buzzing and some are not, and it might be because the fans are running in the summertime. And I, I saw conflicting information that the current tech doesn't make noise. This isn't a problem. That's exactly. Why, you know, and so. Now, I will say, I was in Florida. I was in Punta Gorda. It was 85 degrees. It was in a Walmart parking lot next to I-75. It might have been installed in 1940. We don't know. Yeah. Yeah, and, and because I sat there for 25 minutes, I took the time to get out and no, I, it's, it's, check it out. <laughs> I started with the idea that it was a concern that we share tonight. I was led to believe that maybe it wasn't a concern, but now that we do have level fours, I mean, honestly, I think everything is right except for those little pieces where we're allowing in like gateway one and two. But and again, I can't regurgitate all these, but I just don't. I think we got to be careful in the rest of that. Rather than put the pressure on Peter to find the distance, uh, you can make it consistent okay. with it's either 50 or 100. So uh, from between service non-residential uses and residential or mixed use districts, motor vehicle stations have to be 200 feet. Okay. So if it's a principal use, it would have to be 200 feet from a a lot containing a use separated from a residential or mixed use district. And honestly, that's consistent with the ones I've seen, you know, the, between the one in Seabrook, the one in Kittery and the one I just used. I mean, that's a good number. I mean, because obviously as a principal use, it's going to have a big transformer needs. And that'll yeah, be the well, sole use. Right. Be what the about the use. accessory? Because we were right. what we were yes. thinking of and we would have been off base and Andrew, I'll get to you right next. Uh, what we're thinking of is the the standalone in a parking lot or in the front of a 
Even a, even a residential project is that, frankly, we were thinking, because residents isn't going to want to charge these things, charge their cars at some point right. uh, beyond level two. So that was a thought, but it may have been going too far. Well, I'd take as an example to your point, if the uh, Peverly Hill Road development, I forget the name of it, we all know who built it, I'm not going to say names. Woods. Yeah, There's Parsons somewhere. Woods, but they've got a bunch of common space at the back, you know, where they have the trails and all that kind of stuff. If the developer felt like sticking one in the middle of the common space, that's great. I mean, he'd be doing that as an amenity. No? A lot of that's in conservation, and it's public space, so we can't. <laughs> Good point. But, but that you saw where I was going. If somebody tried to yeah. do that as an amenity to their residents. Mm -hmm. Well, here's what I'm struggling with with the distance requirement, because okay. the distance is, is a... There's no flexibility in a distance requirement. If we had conditional use permit and somebody proposed one, right, you could, they could sound and close it. They could do things that could allow yeah. it to be closer. Sure, give mitigate, the, context mitigate the, the problem. So I'm, I'm leaning toward that approach more. I think about it. Picking up on your concern, but addressing. Well, I, I, I agree with your idea of mitigating it as long as you can determine what you want to mitigate. <laughs> well, sound would be sound would be the, that's what everybody. If they show that they're proposing something that doesn't make sound, and they can demonstrate that, well, they don't have to mitigate it, do they? Agreed. And hopefully, the tech will get there. Uh, well, actually, Andrew was next, and then yeah, <clears throat> might be a silly question, but is there a difference in the principal uses? So, for example, if um, Applebee's on Woodbury wanted to put one in versus the. Uh, Home Sense, formerly Big Lots. Plaza. If either of those wanted to put them, they would be accessory. accessory yes. Right. It so would, my question is: Is there a difference between like restaurant as a principal use and accessory? No. And then, no, it's uniform, just by zone. Just by zone. Yeah. And just to briefly interrupt, we are past ten o'clock. I assume people want to continue talking. Yes. And we, Jane, did want us to talk about the master plan, which I have some things to talk about that too. So we are looking at a little while longer. Just I'm supposed to ask. I'm asking. I'm not going to call for vote unless people want to vote. We're good to keep going. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. <clears throat> uh, regarding the um, the language, and I'm sorry, I did read it. I I, uh, I don't have it in front of it because my laptop died. Um, the whether or not the stations are public or private do we address that if they're public then they're public to the internet which is someone coming up 95 is going to see hey there's a station here I'm gonna pull mm -hmm. it and you're just inviting Loop 95 public as in municipal is there any distinction in our language um, that speaks to a, a, a station that is open to anyone, a charging station that is open to anyone versus a private one on a lot. I think you're talking about there's a commercial and residential. The way I see that. Well, no, so I think commercial is open to the public. Well, a business could do it too, though, right? For their employees. Sure. Mm -hmm. If they were a, a business that had uh, level three chargers and encouraged their employees to drive. Oh, EVs like and it's only yeah it's only for them let me rephrase it so here's, 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 here's a hypothetical situation where so that's an accessory yeah. use yeah hmm? Lonza would be an accessory mm -hmm. so imagine a situation where um, pick the Applebee's um, analogy they decide to put a level three charger in or Home Depot anyway. Home Depot is a good yeah. one yeah. Any, right um, it's open to anyone to use any hour of the day so, so unintended um, considerations might be, okay, it's being used at night. Or is it creating other issues because it's a 24-7 thing open to the public? Or am I getting to, because, you know, because I am tired, am I getting to bog down on the details of it? I think you're underscoring what I was saying about a conditional use permit, because that's okay. when you could consider, consider a conditional use permit. You can consider yeah. what's around if it's it. If yeah. it's in a purely commercial area with, yeah. you know, Yep. But the mixed use zones make a conditional use permit. I yeah. think we cover it if we do the mixed use zones, right? I actually agree with you on that one. Yep. You know, if you if you're mixed sure. use, that's you okay. You can agree with me. <laughs> 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 We're supposed to work together, <laughs> boss. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think the conditional use for, for Gateway One, Gateway Two, or other mixed uses would solve the problem. 
Okay. So, because it allows us to con have condition discussion. it with. Look, look, yeah. Yep. Look, looking at these charts, that would be Gateway One, Gateway Two, Business, and CD Four W, because those both allow residential. Yep. And then general business and industrial would be the only ones that would be permitted by right as an accessory use. And that typically that zoning? zoning would be appropriate. So yeah, I think you just yeah. nailed it. Mm -hmm. yep. But we're just talking with things that can do, because what I don't want to prevent, and maybe I'm getting too tired to think straight about this much detail, but I don't want to prevent them from doing level one and level two right. chargers. Correct. Right. Those, right. Are oh, permitted, no, those are permitted across the board. Yeah, we right. agree. We agree. <laughs> we agree. That would be an EV fueling space A. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. exactly. Okay, now I get where that exactly. all is. I was getting a little confused by that. Small That's the P's, the P's, Beth, P's all across the okay. entire yeah. thing. That's that great, fabulous, wonderful. <laughs> So was the, was the intent, sorry. So, so I'm a student of the process. When you have conditional use uh, mm -hmm. written, do you have in mind what the conditions might be? Or is it just a whatever feels good when something comes in? So if, if you're going to have a conditional use. We try to avoid use, the whatever feels good. It's, it's, they're, they're, in, they're in the ordinance. So it, it would be helpful to have some stakes in the ground uh, as to why we like a Walmart parking lot but we don't like something that has a house next to a, a, a commercial piece. So, so some clarity of thinking about what would grant a conditional use permit, but having most categories be conditional use. I think it's really going to be around noise and, and optics. Yeah. You know, you're going to want to put a, a, a decent looking fence up and you want to keep it quiet. And if the Walmart happens to be abutting a residential neighborhood, then they're going to have to treat it differently beside the residential residences versus sticking it out next to the highway. Exactly. Bill, that was kind of my point about the Islington Street gas stations, how they are in closer proximity to residential areas versus the Walmart example. So right. I, I would agree with you. That's, that's, that was all where my head was Noise, vibration, traffic. Yeah. Yeah. Noise, vibration. noise, vibration, and traffic are, are all, all in the criteria there. for all in the criteria right. already in there. Okay. And can that be different if it is uh, next to a residential? That's why we would act on that condition because it would be based on the specifics of that application. That's why it's better I than a distance. Location. That's what's better than a distance. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. it, it allows this I board to recommend. look at the actual application. What's the actual equipment you're proposing? As, as where you're proposing to put it? What are your hours of operation? Yeah. And it's a public it's hearing where a butters get noticed. So. Yeah. so yeah. It's, they did that. I think that was a good, I think it's good better. catch. I think it's better. I have another potentially silly question. Really silly. City of Portsmouth has a lot of street parking. Is there any conceivable uh, notion that you can have an EV charger at a street parking space? Parrot Ave. Uh, I mean, that would be a city. Lot. That would be a city. Mm -hmm. City would have to do that or approve it. For the record, we already have the underground stuff done at the Bridge Street lot to put in. Right, chargers. I know I know that much. So I'm just yeah. asking about street parking specifically. We have not gone to, we have not even talked about considering that because we're rather doing the parking lots versus on the street. Moving because on. of all the additional equipment you need to do it. There are some issues with it's getting late, but there are some issues with public charging. I did see some federal regulations that prohibited other non-EV vehicles from parking in certain spaces. Hmm. I think it's just in the corridors, that you, the high-powered corridors are putting through some states. But I'd be loath to get into that tonight without more research. But it's a good question. I mean, I've seen them on streets. Sure. Are we ready for a motion? And motion is to recommend make, it to the city we, council. Did you make a motion? <laughs> Uh, I would make a motion that we vote to recommend to City Council the whole first reading on the zoning amendments dated 31424 as just amended tonight. And, <laughs> and the just the amendments are changing one you. and two. Right, as, mm -hmm. as amended tonight. One and two goes to A and B. One, one and two goes to A and B, and B as an accessory use becomes a conditional use permit in the Gateway 1, Gateway 2, Business, and CD4 districts. I think it works. Second. 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 <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Do I vote with Karen not here? Not from what they told me this morning. <laughs> with vote. Karen not here? 
I won't build a vote. I was told that you were Beth's alternate at the moment, so I'm I'm working on it. But that's, singularly Beth. Wow. As I said, I not 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 for topic of discuss. We can discuss discuss this later. Um, so, the uh, the home occupation thing. I had a long discussion with Councilor Cook the other day. Uh, we need to not recommend it as it is. We need to have a public hearing, schedule a public hearing on it because uh, it needs to be expanded. Worth right now, the proposed amendment would be to allow two people to come to a home business. And we need to hear from the artist. I think two is too restrictive, especially if you're having art classes and that sort of a thing. And I, I think the board needs to have a conversation about, you know, um, is it going to be student? Is it going to be children? Is it going to be adults? Is it going to, you know, hours? The kind of things we normally talk about. Um, at, I, at, I, at City Council, we we did talk about this because we had a longer road and it was due to staffing restrictions that they said this would be sort of an interim fix and I questioned the two as well but what it was brought up is if somebody actually wants more than two then they now at least have the basis to go ask for a variance okay well for the interim we, at least after Peter did his memo legal said we should have a public hearing as we normally do yep, so we, we should have do that to. anyway yep if we if the decision is we send the simple thing to council I'm good with that. It's a board decision. And but. then we can, in the longer term, then look at a major change to it. But at least this allows them to do something more immediate and gets them going because oh. they're desperate for us to make a minimal change. Right. Yep. So if uh, in our spare time we can come up with some addition to it, we will. And if not, we won't. Right. Right. <laughs> so we should schedule. Do we, do so, yeah, the recommendation would be to schedule a public hearing at the April 18th planning board meeting. So moved. So moved. Seconded. <laughs> moved and seconded 100 times. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, now, the master plan issue um, and other updates. What I, I know Bill wants to talk about this. Jane wants to talk about this at some length. I'm loath to do that at this hour. I really think we need a workshop discussion about this. Jane doesn't agree with me. Um, That's why she motioned at the beginning of the meeting. She wanted to do it. We were fresh because she knew we'd be dead And now we're pushing it off again yeah, Well, I, we're pushing it off for a good reason. There's no yeah, there's because, no urgency. There's no urgency for this I, I would actually like to make a motion. Can I? You can I make I, a motion. I move that the planning board issue the master plan RFP the RFP To procure a qualified consultant to develop the current updated master plan and that that be issued by April 15th, which, working backwards, would mean review comments from the planning board and the staff would be due to the master plan committee by April 10th. That's 20 days. It's an 11-page document. The staff has had this since February 12, I believe, um, which is more than enough time to send their comments back um, to us. The master plan, in my opinion, is the most important responsibility of the planning board under New Hampshire state statutes. Our master plan is woefully outdated. It's actually not useful in guiding this board's policies and decisions on future growth and development in Portsmouth. So okay. you're speaking to the motion. Let's see if we get a second first. OK. <clears throat> second. You've spoken to it a fair bit. You can okay, continue. so sending this master plan into another calendar year doesn't help us with all of the applications we will see in all of the monthly meetings and special meetings we will have during this year. Furthermore, it's up to the planning board to determine the master plan's next steps, the timeline for this process. Um, so. I would like to see us distribute the RFP that's in final draft form um, to the members of the planning board who've not yet had a chance to review it. And everyone has the 20 days and they send the comments to the subcommittee. We incorporate the comments, 
With the assistance of the staff, we issue the RFP on Monday, April 15th. Okay. What's happened since the subcommittee came up with that draft is I've had a number of discussions with staff and the plan, the current plan is to start that process with consultants in June or July. And one of the reasons for that is there's a lot of things going on in the city right now. The Market Square Master Plan being one of those. That's a master plan. That's interesting that that master plan is forwarded. I mean, the city can do whatever the city wants so to do. What about wait, the wait, planning wait, board? Wait, 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 wait. I wasn't finished. Oh. The, I've talked to one consultant. I've reached out to two other consultants, talked with them about timelines. Any consultant that is ready to do this work as fast as you suggest isn't a consultant that I would recommend the city hire because no, there's I'm not enough lead time. I don't think you're under, I'm saying this motion is about issuing the, the RFP to consultants. It's not about when the when their application to us is due or when the, the work even begins. I'm talking about we constituted a subcommittee in June the subcommittee in its own time took all this time to draft a master plan RFP. I'm saying let's distribute that to our planning board, critical that they have that information. As a professional courtesy, you've distributed it uniform, unilaterally to the city staff. I say let's collect all of those comments now from both sets of people and let's issue that RFP. That's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the consultant actually. Well, you said doing about the getting the work done this year. That's not going to happen. Why? Mr. Who made that time. decision? I, the planning board makes the decision no. about our own timelines, All don't right. we? Let's not argue about it. We have a motion. <clears throat> yes, Joe. Could I ask a, a question of the motion uh, about the motion? Jane, were you suggesting the planning board was going to release the RFP? with assistance from staff but we are going to incorporate the comments and issue the final agreed upon master plan rfp yes quite pro forma really i can tell you that staff isn't ready and um they wanted to have more more input <clears throat> but that aside what's the rush the rush well, can I make a comment? Go ahead. Why are we looking at Market Square when it's optional, where the city master plan is not optional by state statute? Market Square is just something somebody dreamed up. Well, I can answer that because we have a master plan. It's not out of date. It is and the Market Square plan is a separate project. That's the reason for that. Our master plan is required to be updated by statute. And we are at there's the no there's no deadline. There's no expiration date. Well, and as we talked about at the last meeting, our current master plan is serving its purpose. It's need it needs to be updated. I completely agree with everything Jane said about the importance of a master plan. It's not an urgent matter. Period. That, well, that's your opinion, it's Mr. Mr. Chair. Opinion. That's great. But the data behind that is the evidence behind our current master plan is 10 and 11 years old. And as a, ma as a planning board, not only are we mandated to have an up-to-date master plan, but in those 10 years, we've seen unprecedented growth and development in this town. Over and over, for the entire two years of this term, that two, two plus years of this term that I've spent on this board, I've requ requested in different ways data that a planning board needs in order to have a context for making strategic decisions about growth and development. And that includes how, what is our current demand for housing? I hear people talking about it. I, I'd like it actually quantified as best as possible. The demand, <clears throat> how many units have been built, what types of units have been built in these 10 years, you know, et cetera. Same thing about parking. I, I've, I've listed these requests many times, and the staff for two years has not been able to update that data. Let's stay focused on the master plan. Here's something, so we, we, need here's something that. we could do that might satisfy part of what you're 
requesting. We could sub circulate the draft to the planning board members of the draft, the draft scope that we've prepared for comment. Why not? I don't have any problem with that. Great, and we should have the comments back as my motion states so that we, they've got 20 days by April 10th. April 10th, everybody sends their comments back. Even the busy city staff that's now expanded under our new budget and we amalgamate those comments and we are able to issue the RFP. I, I mean, think, by April I 15th, I let's get going. I don't think legally we can issue it. We could approve the scope. I don't think we could actually issue the RFP. I mean, I don't. Legally? You're correct. Legally, I thought, doesn't the planning board set the schedule? I mean, we're the planning board. We can set the schedule. I, we, can't, we can't issue an RFP. Well, well but we can we, set the date that the council will. We could set a date to send it to council. I, or I, I think it's time that we start driving the bus instead of riding in the trailer. Hey. The planning board is, is the ultimate authority on the master plan. At least that's how I understand it. Planning board drives the process. Yes, Andrew. Given that I, as well as I would say a majority of these people, have not been on a master plan uh, process before, can you run me through, any one of you, at, at the three of you, uh, run us through the hypothetical scenario that unfolds upon issuance of or upon approval of an RFP from this board and then the steps thereafter. I think that will help Jane, help myself quite a bit, and the rest of the board understand what the timeline is that subsequently unfolds you know, after we approve an RFP. <clears throat> I'll just start by saying the planning board's never issued an RFP in my time here, which was through and, the and entire it's not about, prior master plan, not, so. I should clarify, not issuing, but I, I guess having a document that we are very confident in uniformly as a board that we hand to city staff and say, hey, this is something that we are in approval of, and then what are the steps? So typically an RFP, like for the Market Square master plan, was drafted, reviewed by legal, yeah. signed off on by departments, <clears throat> then issued and we received um, proposals right. and then had a, like a committee and met and, and scored them, okay. interviewed, did interviews yep. and picked um, the consultant that's working on the Market Square Master Plan. And so what I think would be very helpful for, again, myself and the rest of the board members, I think I speak for everyone, is what is the timeline or the duration that we can expect from the time that we have an approved document from this board to the time we hand it to legal and then the time that legal hands it back to us or administers it, what is that general time frame? I mean, I, I don't know. I can't tell I, you. I can tell you that the springtime is a really hard time to get staff to focus on that because of budget season, sure. right? So budget season kind of overwhelms us through May, which I think is why June was probably a, a month that the staff would be able to focus more on trying to issue. So that. we're talking about a few months plus or minus and ultimately what I would hope we can achieve is giving this document to city staff with enough time that we are not up against ourselves or the calendar when it comes fall or even the end of fall and the beginning of winter. So if I'm understanding Jane correctly, I think it's less so about getting all of these bids back to us, but more so just about getting it in the pipeline and sort of enacting this process now, um, you know, lighting the match, so to speak, and, and then at least feeling like the planning board is doing their part to get this ball rolling. Um, and then working with city staff and communicating to understand where it is, in fact, on their totem pole. And then when it comes back to us, we feel again that we're ready to just send it out when legal gets it back to us. One thing I'll add to that, as you may recall, our subcommittee, the last discussion we had was about possibly changing it to an RFQ, which of course were qualifications. Sure. And um, I, in the discussions I've had with staff, we were leaning, and I was leaning with them towards making a request for qualifications because this is, and one of the reasons that the budget was as high as it was, and assuming it stays that way into next year, it's still a relatively high number, but it's for top tier firms to be able to work on this project and not just get, um, you know, whoever's available 
to do it this summer kind of thing. <clears throat> I had a conversation just today with one with a, a major firm, Torty Gallus, based in D.C. and Los Angeles. They do work around the country and internationally. They are very interested in participating in this. I reached out to Dwani Plater Zyberg. I've reached out to uh, Dover Cole. Andrew's also, Dover Cole was in his, one of his instructors at school. So we've started reaching out to um, consultants to help give feedback into this process. And I think, I think it's, it is moving. And I think it's rationally moving towards a June, July. And I think artificially trying to push it the way Jane is proposing is not the way to go, honestly. You know, Can you clarify I, about what happens in June, July in your scenario? What is it about June? Is it June 2024? What are you saying? It's June, which is a couple of months away. And when what happens then? It's when the process, we probably would have an RFQ ready to discuss with consultants in June or July. So you're amending the motion that we will release it on June 15th? I'm, t I'm discussing things. I haven't made any motion. I can't make a motion. So. I, I don't understand the, the whole idea of the RFQ. I mean, sometimes you say we've discussed it when it's like, I think you've discussed it maybe in City Hall in different meetings, but we three discussed it. In I, his I'm office. actually not in favor of the delay in the process that an RFQ would be. I don't. I don't see what that gets us more than the fact that there are all kinds of cities and towns in New Hampshire who do comply with their mandate to redo their master plans and. They have pools of very good consultants also. I don't think we need to, to insert a delay for some kind of specialized consultant pool that we have to identify before we release this RFP. That's where you, you don't have experience in the field, and I do. And the consultants that you're talking about, we could do that. <clears throat> you know, we could do it for a lot less money, and it'll be a very vanilla and not as useful master plan. Oh. I could, Mr. Excuse, Mr. Chairman, why does an RFP this was your this was your agenda item, yeah. correct? Um, but did you have? Were you just opening it up for discussion, or did you have something to I, share I, with the board or report? I to? did share it, and Jane made mention. Okay, is it is it possible that at the next meeting the the committee can present something to the board? Um, some findings and something for us to review and um, have it on the agenda a, a little closer to the top? Or? Yeah, I mean, that's that's what I made the suggestion earlier to cir circulate the draft uh, bill and then, Jim. So this is parallel but narrower. Uh, I think, and it's about a sense of urgency here, I think the Housing Committee uh, is has been asked and is developing a strategy for housing for Portsmouth. And that a strategy needs to, needs to have some relationship to the planning board. And, and I think the, the housing committee so, will suffer from not having some of the thought processes and, and discipline that the planning board could bring to that. Uh, I've sent you a two-page note of my thoughts on mm -hmm. on what the planning board or what the housing subject is in the context of the planning board. Uh, I, I'm frustrated that I don't know how to get that information either to the planning board or to the housing committee. Uh, so, so there's a there's something that isn't working properly here in terms of the planning board being the lead on strategy in a way that's integrated with the various functions. Uh, the, the housing needs to be looked at in the context of green space and, and uh, economic development and, and a variety of other things. Uh, and and it, it needs support in a disciplined way from the planning staff on some data that they should be asking for and receiving that, that they, are, they haven't. Uh, so, the, the, it, it, it's related to the question of whether we do a master plan or not, but 
But I would just express that frustration on the singular uh, question of housing. And Jim, you had your hand then. Yeah. Uh, can I just refresh my mind about the timeline? Did the master plan subcommittee form in June of 23? Somewhere Correct? around there. Yes. It was last summer. So we've been eight months in now, and now we're going to decide instead of an RFP, we're going to an RFQ. That's going to add another six months to the process. So who's deciding to go to an RF? Q versus an RFP. I mean, that just seems to be a very important decision that should go through the committee because that, there you, that just adds another six months probably. No, it won't add another six months. It's the same It's the same document, just changing the title. So, again, what's the advantage of RF, RFQ You've got, with an RF, versus an with an RFP? RFQ, with an RFQ, you have the discussion with the consultants, but you can amend the scope based on input. That's the advantage to it. If you get the right you get input from multiple firms, and they will notice things that we don't notice things, just like we all did with the EV. So they'll adjust the spec versus us they'll trying propose, to exactly. versus us <laughs> trying to determine the spec, uh, right. not quite completely. They can it's like say, saying you, it's we like just saying you want a wedding cake, Michigan, but then yeah. not this with out flavor. Out well. Yeah, it's like so. I, I write a lot of RFPs and RFQs for the city, and, and the, the difference is you're you're selecting people. The Q is qualification. You're you're selecting someone based on their qualifications, not necessarily their a fixed their set of work or their fee. Or a fixed set of work. Yeah. It allows you to be more selective in in someone's skill level, and it, it's a good vehicle. I think it's a good vehicle. I think it makes I, sense. I was I was just going to say I I don't disagree with a lot of things that are being said tonight, but I what I do question, and I spent time today. Uh, as I do every meeting, plugging the city's website, uh, looking at our current master plan. That, um, and I, I, I looked through every page, and Jane, your name was on there, which was great. You were involved with that, but it's a wonderful document. I, I wasn't involved. I was new. I, okay. I reviewed it without no, I was, context. I was giving you credit okay. for. It. Was yes, my name's on it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've always said my name is okay. on it. I, I know actually, that. Okay, never mind that. I, I, I was really impressed with the document it's a very powerful document i think the the amount of information that's in it i i what i'm saying is i i don't disagree with much here what's being said i disagree that it's not a useful tool still for us and i i, I i'm questioning the urgency of it i know that it's our responsibility i'm looking forward to doing it again i don't want to feel like we're we're under pressure to do it i want to do it right i Again, I encourage everyone, even everyone listening, to look at to look at the master plan. It's a really, it's a wonderful document, and hopefully, we can meet that same quality level when we do it. Did, Jim, did, uh, the master plan that was produced, and, well, went out to bid in 2015. Was that an RFQ and RFP? RFP. RFP. So, I, I think we can just dust off that RFP and just update the numbers and the information and because uh, it's already been you know we have a good template for it that's what we did that's what we started but now that's going to be changed to an RFQ well it's just a change of the title and maybe a couple of other small changes but it's basically the idea was to we started with that document modified it based on current conversations that have been happening in the city and based on the three of us talking about it. And then the idea of switching to an RFQ is not to introduce any great delay. It's just to create flexibility, exactly as Joe was explaining. Can we vote on the motion? There was no more conversation. So Jane's motion. Does it repeat it? Yeah. Sure. Just the motion, not the <laughs> support. Sure. I, I move that the I planning have. board issue the master plan RFP by April 15, 2024, with review comments due to the master plan committee, and that would be from the planning board and the city by April 10. Second. It's already been seconded. You already did. You don't have to second it twice. Second squared. It's late. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Opposed. Opposed. I don't know how to call that. 
I don't either. Roll call. Uh, roll call. Mr. Simonis? Uh, yes. Ms. Begala? Yes. Mr. Giuliano? No. Councilor Moreau? No. Mr. Bowen? Let me see. No, he's not no. voting. Mr. Hewitt? Yes. Mr. Almeida? No. Vice Chair? No. Mr. Chairman? No. Motion fails. Five to three. So, should we have a workshop? Yes. <laughs> we can, okay. It doesn't work to put it in a meeting and an agenda. Yeah, let's have a workshop. Work. I'll, or, I'll call work. it. Or we could just do like a half hour or an hour before <clears throat> one of our meetings. You know, start early and we'll do, do it. both. Maybe do we'll it. do both. Um, I mean, it seems to me that <clears throat> what you suggested, bringing us the draft and we do know in public. showing us what an RFQ looks like yeah. instead of an RFP, yeah. which is not a major change, we, we could probably wrap it up like Beth said in under an hour. Yeah, yeah. In its, in its own meeting, right? But yeah, I, unless there's a way to do it sooner, but okay. well, maybe we start at six instead of seven for one thing, right? It would not, that that figure it out. <laughs> I, I get yeah. the point. <laughs> figure it out. In case you're wondering. Unless you're Doing something. Motion to adjourn. No, no, no. no. Oh, a question. I got a question. No, there's no. a question down there. Yes. Yeah. Just like to read a statement, please. Um, not a long statement, Jane, please. It's going to be what it's going to be. No, it because isn't. We're no, doing it isn't. It if it's going to be end. a long statement, I'm going to How many minutes do I have, Mr. Chair? I'll give you three. Okay. Mr. Chair and the members of the Planning Board, it's with profound regret that I hereby resign from the Board effective immediately. I resign in good conscience, recognizing that I've done everything I could to advocate for timely critical data collection necessary to support this board's decisions and to do actual planning. I'm left with no recourse but to resign since the board is ineffective, lacks rigor, and has been relegated to peripheral roles by the city council and staff. This board has, during my two tenures, been a virtual rubber stamp for whatever development projects our developers and their teams of well-paid lawyers engineers and architects have proposed to build. City planning staff invariably recommends that we approve these projects and the board generally does whatever it is asked to do. Virtually every developer who applies gets a conditional use permit, which is essentially a variance or special permit, to build more square feet or build in otherwise prohibited areas or include otherwise prohibited uses beyond what our zoning co code allows, generally with no meaningful benefit for the residents of Portsmouth. Apparently, our zoning co code doesn't need to be compli complied with if you want to build a big project. This situation is eroding our zoning code and renders our zoning code largely ineffective. The exception becomes the rule. The results of all of this, well, look around. The board has rubber stamped a whole lot of new luxury and market rate condos. Wish I had the data on it, but I don't. Some with penthouses, new hotel rooms, and very little actual affordable workforce housing that city council claims is really their big priority. And many parts of Portsmouth are losing their historic character charm and are starting to look like Boston or Cambridge. As I've repeatedly pointed out, we have a hopelessly outdated and essentially irrelevant master plan that fails to address what Portsmouth has become in the last 10 years of rapid growth and development and where we're going and want to go. But apparently our chair and the four city staff who sit on this nine member board don't think we need to update our master plan anytime soon. Instead, I think controlled by the City Council, they turned their attention to the master plan of Market Square. Downtown's aesthetics are always a priority over the neighborhoods in this city. As a planning board, it's our statutory responsibility to review, revise even portions of the master plan. We don't have to take the whole thing on at once. It's fine, I'll be submitting it to you in writing and to the paper. Thank you very much. Any 
motion to adjourn. The meeting is adjourned.